Hello and welcome to another Zodin session. How about that? How about that? But you didn't expect that shit to happen. So, today we continue programming in Rust again. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry, everyone who uh, subscribed to me to because of C or some other languages, Haskell, whatever. But I switch languages all the time, so um, so there, there are times when I'm being when I'm like you know programming in Rust for quite some time, and maybe next week I'm going to be switching to JavaScript. Who knows? So today we continue programming in Rust. <laughs> yeah. And today we continue uh, developing the, the the project that we've been developing for um, you know like four days I think this is the fifth one if I'm not mistaken this is the fifth episode the project is called Two Impact for You. The original idea was to uh, explore a very simple uh, video format. And while exploring a very simple video format, we came up with a pretty cool uh, video audio generator, right? And uh, I looked at that video audio generator and I thought, this shit is cool. I want to render that shit in real time. Right, and that's gonna be the topic of today's stream. We're gonna take the engine of the video generator and we're gonna slap some real-time rendering on top of it using OpenGL. Does it sound good? Does it sound something interesting? So we can take a look at, uh, at uh, what kind of videos does it generate, just to recap what we've done so far. So it's gonna be tossing, uh, tossing, yes, of course, tossing, TOSing. So I should rename, if I ever get banned, I should rename myself to TOS Ding, yes. <laughs> Very funny, I'm sorry, it's it's, it's too dumb. Uh, so this is gonna be that, and I think I need to uh, fetch the latest shit. <clears throat> fetch the latest shit. Git merch origin master. There we go. So let's generate some shit. So maybe, uh, so as far as I know, the script by default starts playing the video. So I'm going to actually disable that. And uh, let's go ahead and generate some videos. Mm. <sighs> Two le bytes. Two le bytes. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So it's basically, uh, essentially what it does, it generates a video in that simple video format and also generates audio in a PTM file. So, and after that, it uses FFmpeg to actually merge them together into the final video. So prepare your ears because uh, the video audio generator is a little bit ear rapey. So uh, I'm about to play that shit. Uh, where, where am I? I think, okay, so I was actually typing commands into OBS instead of my terminal. Uh, so yeah, get ready. So this is basically what it generates. Isn't that cool? So that video is generated completely from scratch. Each individual frame of that video is generated on CPU pixel by pixel, and each uh, and the audio was generated uh, sample by sample. All of that was dumped into files, into raw files, and then merged together using FFmpeg. So there's no special libraries, there's no special frameworks, there's nothing. We literally generated it pixel by pixel, sample by sample. And we actually generated sine waves to, to play the sounds and stuff like that. And we also mixed them together and everything. That's what we did. So it's like a pure programming. Like everything here is basically made from scratch, except, except uh, actually converting to a video format that is suitable for viewing, um, you know, with a player or something like that. And yeah. That's basically what we've done so far. But it doesn't render shit in real time, right? This shit is cool. As I already said, this shit is very cool, right? Well, relatively cool. They're, they're more cool shit. I do admit that. Uh, so, um, and I want to render that in real time because waiting uh, this amount of time every, uh, every time you want to, you know, check the update, it's kind of lame, right? So, and today we're going to be slapping some OpenGL on top of this application. That's all we're gonna be doing. Uh, so I suppose I'm gonna uh, put um, the link to the source code of the project in the description, right? 
So, uh, let me go to the description. I'm not sure if I actually saved that description. So, uh, because so this is the previous one, I'm gonna actually back it up just in case. Description.md, and we're gonna have references here. All right, so source code, uh, source code is gonna be available here. Yet again, for people who just joined, you can find the source code in here if you are in fact interested. And we've been developing this thing for already like eight episodes. Uh, so I'm gonna give you the link to the playlists uh, of these episodes, right? So um, let's just see. Uh, Sodium Daily, so you can find that on the Sodium Daily YouTube channel. So for people in Twitch chat, you can find this thing in here. And uh, so I created the playlist for, for the entire series. So right now only three episodes are available, but we already done four. Uh, so the fourth one is going to be actually published today. So to impact for you uh, playlist, right? So here is the playlist. And for people in, uh, in chat, here is the playlist if you are interested in this kind of shit. All right, so how are we going to be uh, implementing the OpenGL support, right? So you would probably think that finally Zosin is about to introduce some sort of a third party dependency, so he must use Cargo, right? So the, finally the time has come when Zosin will start using Cargo and uh, everyone will cheer in ecstatic ejaculation, right? So, um, no, we're not going to be doing that. <laughs> Uh, we, we're still going to be using third-party dependencies for OpenGL and for creating Windows. The thing about OpenGL is that even though it's a cross-platform uh, graphics API, it has uh, no um, it has no cross-platform way of creating a window, right? Uh, so, and for that, people usually use such libraries as SDL or GLFW or GLUT or some other shit. And people developed a shit ton of different like ways of creating a cross-platform window. So we're going to probably be using uh, GLFW uh, because uh, it's more lightweight than uh, SDL and I'm familiar with it. So yeah, so there, there's two criteria in here. So the way we're going to be using these libraries, we're going to be uh, linking with them directly. Right. So one of the things the Rust can do, it can actually link with C libraries directly. You can essentially um, define or declare rather, you can declare external functions and just use external C functions from Rust. And that's the way we're going to be uh, using uh, GLFW and OpenGL functions to create an OpenGL renderer. Though you could probably use uh, um, already pre-made bindings right, from Cargo, right, but um, the thing is, it is not that difficult to create such bindings yourself, right, so here's the thing, you are not going to be using each, each an individual function in GLFW and each an individual function in GL, as a matter of fact, uh, our application is going to be using a very small subset of this function, which means we don't need to have all of the bindings, right? We can uh, create um, quite easily only the bindings that we need for that specific project, and there will be not that many of them, seriously. So it's a little bit of a tedious work, but um, it's actually, you will see that it actually speeds up as you add more and more functions. And uh, the benefit of that is that you don't depend on some uh, person's library that can be withdrawn from the uh, crates.io or what's the, what's the repo of, for, for the cargo and then your application doesn't build in a year right your application will be a build as long as glfw exists and as long as opengl exists and what's interesting is that glfw been around for quite some time already it's a well-known library people depend on this library so uh there is a less chance of it dying all of a sudden even glut even though glut is considered to be dead People just picked up this library and continue maintaining it. And furthermore, they created uh, re-implementations of GLUT interfaces. So if you have a code that depends on GLUT, uh, it's, it will still work with a different library. So, and uh, yeah, with, with maybe you can do the same stuff with Cargo, but that's a lot of like additional overhead and it's just like a messy. It's, it's better to have the full control over the situation. So not full control, but as much control as you can. And that's basically the reason why I want to do that, right? You may not necessarily want to do the, uh, the things the way I do them, but that's explanation why I do them the way I do. 
So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just freaking do that. So here's an interesting thing. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting architecture of our renderer, right? Let's take a look at the architecture. So right now we have only two modules. We have a main module and we have a sim module. Right, all of the code that is responsible for simulating the physics of rectangles and generating the sound and stuff like that, all of that is comprised in sim module, right? So the entire logic of the application is within the sim module. So, and the main module basically wraps that simulation module and constantly asks it, generate me the next frame, generate me the next 16 uh, milliseconds of the audio. Right, and it constantly asks and then advances the simulations and then it saves the frames into the video file and it saves the sound into the audio file. Right, so that's the main purpose of the main module. So you can think about this architecture like so. Uh, right, so uh, here is the sim module, simulation module, uh, right? And essentially the main module, the main module wraps uh, this entire thing. Uh, and uh, then pulls out the sound uh, from this thing, like sound, and saves it to the uh, PCM file. PCM file, then pulls out the video uh, and saves it to the uh, Y4M file, which is the video format that we use in here. Right, so that's basically it. So the main thing is responsible for the main event loop and it just like pulls the simulation, extracts the sound, extracts the video and so on and so forth. The simulation doesn't even know that the output, its output is saved into files. It doesn't really care and it doesn't even need to know that. So the idea is gonna be the following. We're gonna create OpenGL renderer uh, open GL uh, renderer render uh, the rare that basically takes the same simulation module right in a, in a very same way uh, simulation and also wraps it around like so right it basically wraps it around like so uh, it will extract the uh, frames right so this is going to be the video and it's going to render those things via OpenGL in the real time. And then maybe later, we'll see how it goes. It will extract the sound the same way as the main thing does in here, right? Sound and maybe play it with, I don't know, ALSA, right? If we're on Linux, right? Uh, so play it with the ALSA. So you see the simulation core is going to stay the same regardless of uh, what you're doing, whether you're generating a video or whether you're previewing with OpenGL and ALSA, right? It just doesn't really matter. Um, so everything is abstracted away here. And because of that, um, we're going to have two executables, right? Uh, the first executable is the video generator and the second executable is going to be the OpenGL previewer. Right, maybe at some point we can basically combine these two things and you'll be able to switch between the modes uh, with a runtime flag, uh, but it's not really needed right now. It's just like something that you can do possibly. So, but we're not gonna focus on that right now. So right now I'm gonna start like uh, developing OpenGL render and we'll see how it goes. I'm not gonna uh, right away put the simulation module in here. Right, I'm gonna just uh, create the renderer that uh, creates the window, initializes OpenGLs, compiles the shaders, and just displays something with the shaders, just to make sure that this entire thing works. And then if we have enough time, we can try to integrate that simulation module into the thing. And uh, maybe we're gonna render the frames into a texture, right, for now. So uh, to make things a little bit faster, maybe we're gonna uh, add another layer of abstraction. So the simulation, instead of rendering frames pixel by pixel would tell the platform to put a rectangle in a particular place and then we could generate the rainbowish thing with the fra uh, with the fragment shaders to speed things up but i'm not sure if it's needed mm, are you using unreal engine no does the abstraction of sim have a performance overhead uh everything has a performance overhead uh it's just a matter of whether you care about that performance overhead and whether you know what exactly is the bottleneck. But uh, apart from that, everything has a performance overhead. So it uh, depends also what you mean by overhead, right? Um, so. Um, okay, uh, let's continue. 
Mm, so this is called main. Uh, and I would like to call it something differently, you know, um, so it would be nice to call it mm, main mm, 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 Main of So how would you call a program that generates like a video? Uh, how would you call a, a thing that generates a video? Man, it's so hard like okay, let's call it main video. I suppose uh main video so that's that's literally what it's going to be called and we're going to have a second one which is going to be called main opengl right so and here is the uh thing so this is going to be main right and uh in here we're going to have something like hello uh world right so let's uh try to recompile this entire thing it's gonna be rust c main opengl.rs and there we go we created main opengl how about that uh yeah we're already good to go so we already can print something to standard output which already sets ourselves to a pretty good success i think i think we're pretty good to go so uh first thing we need to do we need to create a window right so we're going to be creating a window with glfw glfw uh so an opengl library well it's not really opengl library it's also a vulcan library right so and let's take a look at the documentation all right so first thing you need to do you need to initialize uh the glfw you need to call glfw function as i already said uh you can actually um, declare external c functions and i don't remember how to do that so uh i think we're gonna take a look at the rust docs <clears throat> learn rust programming language so uh, as far as i know linking is described i think it's described in a reference or maybe uh rustonomicon let's, let's actually say i think it's somewhere here uh i think it was somewhere here maybe it's linking i think it's like a straight up ffi yeah we will need to do ffi in here uh yeah this is how we do that so we have external uh block right so this is going to be external and in that block you will need to specify a function so it's going to be fn glfw init and i don't really know the signature of this function right i don't really know the signature of this function uh let's actually take a look glfw init ah there we go so it doesn't accept anything but it returns the integer and that integer basic basically indicates whether you did that successfully uh, so, and uh, now, um, if I try to just call this function, glw init, um, okay, and what we're gonna do in here, uh, I might as well just do a return, just to see what is gonna be returned. Um, glw initialized with, um, and let's put this thing in here. Okay, so if you try to compile this entire thing, I don't think it's going to work well uh, because you will need to uh, link with the appropriate library, right? Mm. Okay, so uh, unsafe. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So everything that you declare with the external uh, block, right? So everything is automatically considered unsafe. So everything we're going to be doing in here is in fact completely unsafe, right? So I'm going to actually put everything into unsafe block. I, I know that it's going to actually piss off a lot of people, uh, but it is what it is and it isn't what it isn't. So, okay. As you can see, the linker actually didn't like that. Uh, it couldn't uh, so main open gel, uh, so it couldn't find gel of w init function, right? So it couldn't find the specific function. So you need to use the link uh, macro thingy. I don't know how it's called. I don't know Rust. So it's going to be link uh, name and uh, what library do you link with? So it's going to be package config uh, list all uh, grab gel fw and we're going to grab it with uh, like case insensitive thing. So it's gel f3. So package config, uh, c flags, libs. Actually, we probably only need libs, right? glfw3, there we go. So you just link with this specific name in here, right? So glfw, uh, glfw, and uh, let's see. And there we go. So glfw was initialized with one. We already successfully initialized. I think we successfully initialized it, didn't we? Uh, right, so let, let me actually see. Um, 
GL of W, GL of W init. Right, so in case of a uh, success, it returns GL of uh, W true. And I don't really know what is GL of W true. Uh, it is uh it's not def oh okay so why did they move it here what the fuck is wrong with them <laughs> what's the point this is so dumb why why like like just fucking put it like put anyway so it is one right so as you can see it is one uh so and uh as you can see it initialized with uh success cool so we didn't use any cargo, any bindings or anything like that. We just say, okay, here is the function. Here is the library where you can uh, find that. You, you, you just can run it. You, you don't have to use cargo. You just don't have to. Mm, 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 mm. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's the way uh, we're going to continue developing this entire thing until it shows something that resembles, you know, shader graphic on the screen. So yeah, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, so the next thing we need to do, we need to create a window, right? But I think I'm going to actually go for glfw terminate, right? So because I want to like um, init and then terminate and write my code between initialization and termination. I usually like to sort of like define these like brackets of initialization and termination and do the thing between them. So I don't forget to terminate, right? Uh, so, and let me uh, see, GL of W terminate, uh, GL of W terminate, uh, and this is actually a very simple function, you can just say uh, GL of W terminate, uh, terminate, and uh, then I can just go uh, call this thing in here, GL of W terminate. So this thing does not return anything, it doesn't accept anything, and I can just do it, and there we go. So everything's fine. So the next function we'll probably need is glfw create a window. This is a very interesting function because it has a bunch of shit in it. It accepts quite a few of shits, as you can see, right? Quite a few of shits, and it also returns the window. Okay. So let's take a look. Uh, so this entire thing returns a window. So it's a pointer, but I'm not sure if the window is uh, like a well-known structure. Uh, it's, it's not even known. Uh, this is what we call an opaque uh, data type in, in the business. Or they, they even mention that. You see, it's an opaque data type. So because of that, it has to be represented maybe in our code as a void star pointer, right? So let's actually go somewhere um, to some sort of documentation. So this is a re reference. Uh, so, uh, but I need the API docs. I wonder where I can have an API docs. So this is not an API docs, Rust um, API docs. Yeah, there we go. So uh, we're gonna have this thing in here. So this is the introduction. So, uh, all right. So I do know that somewhere in, F yeah, there we go. So in FFI, we have C void and C void, is it defined in any specific way or is it just, oh, okay, it's, it's a magical thing in here. Uh, <laughs> okay. There's a lot of shit in here, but I mean, okay. Uh, I can import uh, STD FFI um, C void, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and define a type GL of W, GL of W window, uh, C void. There we go. So, and then I'm going to say that this entire thing will return, uh, I suppose, a mutable pointer to GL of W. We're using the row pointers, by the way. So when you're working with C, I think that's what you're supposed to use. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you can actually swap it out to references, but I'm not 100% sure. Not 100% sure, but if we, we swap it out to references now, we'll have to start thinking in terms of the lifetimes, so, right? So the lifetime of this object starts when you create the window and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm just prototyping the thing and I don't really want to worry about it right now. Maybe later when, I'll, uh, when we have something working and I will try to strengthen it up. Right, so maybe I'll start uh, putting more and more safe safety features in there. But as you prototype, I don't think it's it matters. It's only like gets into your way. So uh, we're not going to be doing that. Okay, so this thing is going to be accepting i32, and this one is also i32. Mm. Uh, 
so uh, the next thing is the title. Okay, so with the title, it's rather interesting. So we probably will need C char. All right, so C character. So it's OS row and is defined as I8. Okay, so let's actually use it. It's kind of strange that C uh, like void is defined in FFI, but C char is defined in OS row, whatever the fuck is that supposed to mean? So I, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not supposed to be using uh, this particular module. Um, platform specific type as defined by C code that interacts with FFI almost will almost certainly be using the base types uh, provided by C. Uh, okay, so that's probably what we want to use, right? So there's C int, C char. Um, so, and C int is I32. So let's actually replace these things with C int. I think that would make a little bit more sense, right? So it's going to be C int. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Okay. So the next thing is going to be uh, taking the title, right? And the title is essentially going to be a constant pointer to C character, right? A constant pointer to C character. Uh, let's actually reduce that. And the next thing we have to provide is a monitor. I have no idea what is a monitor. I suppose it's a monitor on your machine, right? So if you have two monitors, which one you want to put your window in, right? So in, in this example, we're using null for both. So it doesn't really matter, but I still want to create, a, you know, monitor thingy for, uh, you know, for, for just documentation purposes, why not? Right. So this is what we're going to have in here. Uh, so here is the monitor and this one is going to be a pointer and i suppose it's a mutable pointer and a shear i have no idea what is a shear but it's a window and it's also supposed to be put into the um into the null so it doesn't really matter okay so we have this function okay uh so and uh let's see what we can do so i can create a window uh we'll have to provide the width so the width is going to be in let's extract width to some sort of like a constant variables or something so this is going to be width and this is going to be height and uh by default i think i'm going to do it like use size because that's usually what size is uh width and height 600 so, but here I'll have to cast it to C int, right? And the reason why I want to do that is because I might use this constant for something else in the future. For example, for allocating an array of um, of the same size, right? So for for back buffer or something like that. And usually uh, array sizes they are accept use sizes. So uh, the title, okay. So with uh, with the with the C string in Rust, it, it's a little bit kind of wonky. You're supposed to be using something called C string, I think, right? So you're supposed to be using C string, and then in a C string you would be able to do something as uh, C string or as pointer. Yeah, yeah. So then you will be able to do as pointer and convert that to, uh, you know, C char and whatnot. Okay, so let's actually see how you can constru uh, construct C string. Uh, so there was a new in here, right? So here is a new and it accepts something that can be converted into a vector of u8. So you, you can probably use like a string literal or something. So this is going to be title and then so this is going to be C string new. And what we're going to do in here is uh, to impact uh, to impact for you, right? So and as far as I know, new returns, yeah, it returns the result because you may have some sort of an error if you are not null terminated or something. I have no idea. Um, so, and we're going to unwrap this entire thing. Okay. So after that, I should be able to just do something like, uh, uh, title and then as PTR, as PTR. So, and in here I can just provide nulls. So to get nulls, right, I think I'll have to extract them from, uh, yeah, from here. So it's a STD pointer, right? So it's going to be use STD PTR null. And as far as I know, there's two variants of null. There's like constant null and mutable null. So for our case, we're only going to use a mutable null, right? So both of these things are going to be mutable nulls. Uh, null mutable, right? Which is kind of funny that uh, null can be mutable, but hey, that's the flow of the type system. Uh, so, 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 okay, so what do we have in here? We forgot uh, a semicolon, there we go. So what else do we have in here? C int, okay, so we probably need to extract this kind of thing, right, C int. So let's go to the compilation errors, C string. So C string uh, probably should have actually imported from FFI, 
Right, so this is gonna be FFI. Uh -huh. C string, there we go. Do you need anything else? Uh, okay, oh shit. Have you seen that? Have you fucking seen that? Who, who's seen that? The screen just blinked. You know what that means? That means that for a brief second, this mother flipper created a window. We can even confirm that, I suppose. We can just say something like print ln, uh, created a window, and can I print a pointer? Because I know in C you can just take a pointer and print it. I wonder if that's the thing you can do in in Rust. Uh, maybe you'll have to put print debug it. Right, so let's actually print debug it. And yeah, you can. So here is the pointer to the window, right? And as far as I know, if you cannot create a window, it should crash. Or oh, I mean, it should return a null. Right, so we can try to che check that. How do you check for null? Is there any way, so like is null, right? So, okay, a pointer, whatever the fuck it is, uh, uh, has a method is null. And a pointer, uh, row and save, okay, so any pointer has this method. So I can do something like uh, window is null, um, and we can just do something like panic, uh, panic uh, could not, could not create a window, um, right? And we're gonna just panic, right? So, uh, and I suppose it will just work. I wonder in which situation uh, we are going to not be able to create a window, probably when we don't have an access to the access, right, to the access system. Um, so uh, I suppose one of the things I can do, uh, so in here, Here's the full path. I can re-log in as a different user. I can re-log in as a different user and I can call this executable from a different user. So if I'm logged in as a different user, it doesn't have an access to the to my current display because it's a different user, right? So if I try to run uh, main OpenGL from this thing, it panics and says could not create it yet, okay. So we can now detect, uh, yeah, yeah, so it couldn't even initialize GL of W. So yeah, with this kind of stuff, we can even check for errors. Um, and I suppose one of the things we can do in here, if uh, this entire thing is equal to zero, right? Uh, right, uh, something like panic, um, could not initialize GLFW. So that's the thing that you have in here. And uh, then here we can do something like uh, initialized glfw, right? So we're going to be doing logging just to indicate what what happened, right? So I'm going to uh, recompile this entire thing. Okay, initialized gl, create a window, but on a different user that doesn't have an access to the display, uh, it right away says that it couldn't even initialize glfw because it probably couldn't even connect to the x display, right? Why x open display function of xlib if it's using xlib? But let's be honest, everyone is using xlib because everyone is too scared to reimplement except maybe xcb uh speaking of xcb by the way uh i know nothing about xleap and xcb relationship and stuff like that but uh, i thought that xcb was developed as an alternative to xleap because xleap is over bloated piece of shit wasn't that the reason why xleap was created xcb was created right does anyone know uh kind of Here's an interesting thing. The other day I was exploring the source code of Xleap and I found a very strange thing. I suppose this is the source code of Xleap, right? So it's a mirror. I would assume that it's a mirror of like an official thing, I think. So if we clone this entire thing, okay, I'll, I'll just let's take a look at some of this stuff. It's, it's really, really interesting. So uh, let's go to third party dependencies. Uh, right, so it's a good clone and let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so it, it doesn't really have that much, uh, you know, commit, so it should actually clone everything relatively fast. So the thing that you have to do the first when you start XLN application in XLeap, you have to call a function X open display. I wonder if I have a man page for that. No, I don't, but that's the function that you have to call. So if you take a look at where it is defined, X uh, open display. So it is defined somewhere in opendis.c. So I might as well probably do a CM thing in here just for, you know, for, for the convenience. So we can jump in there. And okay, how does it establish the connection? So it 
you know, defines some variables and stuff like that. It just checks the uh, display environment variable. That's basically what it does. Uh, it says in documentation and stuff like that. And um, allocates some memory, nothing particularly special. And then it calls a very strange function. Okay, so what the fuck is this function? Um, okay, so XCBD... Wait, what? Okay, so it calls to this function to create a connection. XCB parse display, XCB... Okay, maybe XCB is some sort of a term that exists within XLib or something. Right, and let's actually try to grab for this function. And this function is nowhere to be found. It's not in xlib. Um, but this function calls to it. So let's actually go to, uh, to headers, to user um, include headers and find xcb. And let's grab for this function. Right, so here's xcb. Uh, eh? It opened guinea or something. But anyway, uh, it's a XCB function. I have no idea if I downloaded the right source code. Can anyone tell me if this is the right source code? But according to this source code, XLib depends on XCB. So, it's kind of strange, don't you think? It might be uh, two things. Um, I'm looking at the wrong code, and this is something weird. Uh, or um, my assumption about the reason why XCB uh, existed are actually wrong. It's lower level than XLib, I think XLib. You think, but what's the actual lore behind XCB? Uh, so. My point was, I thought that the point of XCB was that some people were not happy with XLib and they implemented functionality with, uh, uh, of XLib and called this XCB and it's like an alternative thing. And because of that, I wouldn't expect XLib to depend on XCB. Uh, so, and I suppose my assumption is wrong. But what's the, what's the actual lore? Like, okay, you, you think that it's that, but what's the actual lore? I also thought one thing, but it turned out it's not really Double that. Null, null uh, thank you, Binyar, for uh, five months of tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There is a page on xorg a wiki that explains it. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, the libxcb package provides an interface to the X window system, uh, which replaces the current XCB. X can also use XCB as a transport layer, allowing software to make. Well, that's precisely the information I got from the uh, from this uh, from reading the XLib source code. You're not telling me anything new. Anyway, so let's continue working on this entire thing. Uh, all right. Mm. XCB was designed as a smaller, modernized replacement for XLib. I also know that. So, uh, so how does it, what's the actual, what actually happens? I know what is the XCB, I know what is the XLib. My question is, what actually happened? What's the drama? I'm not interested in technical part of XLib and XCB. I'm interested in drama, right? If there is no drama in this situation, XCB versus XLib, I'm not even interested. I already see that, yeah, they use whatever. So what's the drama? Is XCB uh, re-implemented XLib and it was so cool that XLib re-implemented itself in terms of XCB? Now that's the juicy drama I want. Is that what happened? Is, is that what happened, right? Right, right, right. So that's what I care about. Uh, everything else, who fucking cares about the technical stuff? I mean, come on, seriously. Um, so, uh, let's go. <laughs> what, the, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> Uh, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, so, let's continue. <laughs> so, let's focus on this shit. <clears throat> uh, so, we created a window for a brief second, right? Uh, so, the next thing, uh, we need, what we need to do, we need to create the context. So uh, it's relatively easy, but it doesn't really get us anywhere. 
So what I'm thinking, the function that will get us closer to actually like a window that you can touch is JLW window should close, right? So this function essentially checks whether you need to close and you can use this function to organize the, the loop, right? So let's actually go to, uh, you know, a user include uh, JLW, JLW something, something. Um, this is not what I wanted, I need to actually go here uh should close yeah there we go so here's the function so it uh, accepts the window and returns an integer so let's actually go ahead and do that so there we go there we go should close and it will return c int and it will accept a window uh mutable there we go so uh and while uh jlfw sh uh, window should close for the window uh, equal to zero right it shouldn't close right we're gonna be I suppose uh, doing nothing but at least we need to pull the events right so let's actually pull some events uh, JLW pull events uh, right so you see it's not that difficult to write your own bindings you just write an application and uh, as you write an application you just pull out the function that you need not the functions you deserve, but the functions you need. And uh, yeah, so and effectively you will have like a subset of the bindings that uh, make your application work. So, yeah. And then you do jlw. Uh, pull, uh, pull events. And there we go. So that's the simple event loop that we can organize. And if I try to compile this entire thing, and a boom, we have a window. Uh, <clears throat> So, no cargo, no bullshit wrappings, no safe wrapping and safe wrapping, just a single file, boom, we have a window. Sorry, it's just like, I don't have to use cargo. I know some people might be mad at me for not using cargo, but I just, you see, I just don't have to. It's just like, boom, I have a window. Uh, cross-platform. JLW is cross-platform, yes. JLW was designed to be cross-platform, wasn't it? I think. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Open source library works on Windows, Mac OS X11. Well, it even works on Wayland. Look at that. So yeah, the, the library is cross-platform, and I can use OpenGL and Vulkan from it, and easy. So a lot of the things uh, on Cargo are basically wrappers around these libraries anyway. Here's the thing. So you can like pick like maybe a random, like a graphical framework on in Rust. And uh, this is your app. This is your app here, right? So here is your app. Then your favorite framework somewhere here that you use, right? So below that framework, below that uh, framework there is a shit ton of useless crap safe unsafe bindings wrappers around wrappers wrappers around wrappers like shit ton of stuff and down below you have glfw <laughs> glfw an open gl <laughs> so <laughs> right so that's how it usually goes so essentially what i just did i just say well um well fuck that just like fuck all of that uh, not that that one but like i mean fuck all of this mess fuck all of that frameworks and i'm gonna just like you know use this shit directly G give me that shit directly right so that that's basically what i did um so yeah i know that will piss off some people right but it is what it is that's the reality that's the reality of the situation uh i just don't need all of that crap it's that simple okay Mm, 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 mm. So, uh, before we can use OpenGL, before we can use OpenGL, uh, I think, um, I think we need to make the OpenGL, uh, like current context or something. With the current context, I think, um, yeah, we also need to pick a specific version of OpenGL, but, uh, I think we can do that later. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, GLFW and OpenGL are also the unsafe stuff. Okay, so what? Mm -hmm. So what's going to be the next argument? Think about the children? Or what? What, what, what? What's the problem? What's the problem? Why is that an argument that I have to use Karga? And depend on all of that useless crap. How is that an argument? I don't have to. Everything works without it. Mm, I don't understand. Mm, okay. So, uh, JLW make uh, context current. JLW make context current. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so we need to define this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be mutable. There we go. So, but I wonder if it's going to create the right thing. Uh, also, error handling in GLFW is rather weird. As you can see, some of these things don't return an error. Uh, but we can uh, actually create an error callback of some sort. But I don't really, I'm not really sure if I want to go into the error callbacks right now. Uh, so, yeah. And also with the callbacks, you have to be very careful, especially if you panic within the callback, right? Because panicking in... <laughs> panicking Skywalker. Uh, panicking uh, may start unwinding the stack. And imagine you actually pass a function to a C code, and that function starts unwinding the stack from within the C, right? So it's actually a classical situation. Uh, stuff like that already happened in C++, right? I remember like learning C++ like 10 years ago and the, like almost the first thing in the chapter about exception that people uh, tell you is that be careful with the functions that you pass into the C code because if the function throws an exception within the C code, it may fuck up the runtime. <laughs> scary computers, pointers, pointers are scary. Uh, so yeah, ba basically it's, it's kind of a similar situation as with uh, C++. Anyway, so uh, yeah, because of that, I don't really want to go into the callbacks right now, but maybe later we can go back to them. So yeah, chat, remember being afraid of pointers. That's very important. Uh, be afraid of pointers all the time. <clears throat> Uh, so we're pulling the events and uh, yeah, created the current context. Yeah, yeah, so I still didn't create the current context. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pointers are scary. Pointers are scary. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so, and how do I specify the, um, the version of the OpenGL? So let's go to GLFW and, uh, does it have a section about OpenGL? So this is documentation. Yeah, finally. Context guide. This is what I wanted. I wanted the context guide. Um, so version uh -huh. glad we're not using glad for sure um, wait i think it's a it's a hint yeah, yeah i don't remember it's a hint um jlw documentation is such a crap holy shit <laughs> Uh, is that in here? Uh, version... Yeah, finally! Holy shit! It's, it's not even in context guide or something. Uh, okay. Uh, context measure, right. So, and how do you use it? So, where do I put that thing? Supported default values window... Uh, So I remember it has something to do with window. It's, it's such a crap, like, I swear to God. JLW window, window hint. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Okay. Oh my God. Oh. Like, literally, like you fuck up documentation. Really, you fucked up your documentation really, really badly if it's just easier to look into the headers. 
Like, ah, uh, just so much irrelevant crap. It's insane. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, we're gonna put this thing uh, here in like that, and this is gonna be the value. Right. Let me see. Mm -mm. So window hint and uh, so gl fw context uh, yeah so we'll need at least these two versions uh, two functions in here right not the versions um, constants right so this is gonna be the const and I'm gonna be c int right and I'm probably gonna be doing something like there we go uh, so and let's actually set the values for all of these things. I suppose you need to do that before you create a window, right? So this is going to be a glfw uh, context major version. So the version is going to be like, uh, I think we're going to be use third one and then we're going to have the minor one, uh, also three. There we go. So I suppose that should work. And if I uh, put something unreasonable in here, 69 for 20, it should not be able to create the window. Okay, so could not create a window. I wonder how can we get the actual, uh, you know, error, JLW get error. Um, uh, I remember I had something like that. Oh, I also remember that I have an old version of JLW that doesn't have get error. So <laughs> I guess it is what it is and it isn't what it isn't. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. So we can put something like to do, uh, get the uh, human readable uh, readable error uh, message, right? Because they relatively recently introduced that thing. And before that, you were supposed to be using a callback. You were supposed to be using callback. Maybe because of that, it makes sense to introduce the callback. Let's introduce the callback. <laughs> JLW set error. Yeah, there we go. Set error callback. Let's actually go there. Uh, oh shit! It accepts a function pointer, and we need to do function. Oh, yikes! Okay, let's take a look at the documentation. Uh, so I remember that there was something in here. Uh, colon foreign functions. Save interface, destructors, callbacks. Okay, so callbacks from C to Rust function. This is precisely what we need. So this is basically what we need in here. Uh, and yep, okay, so that makes sense. I wonder if I can like create a type function for this kind of thing. Let, let me actually see if I can write something like, uh, something like this. It's gonna be type. And this is the function that accepts an integer, right? Uh, it accepts an integer. Uh, so let me see. Do I have to provide the names in here? I don't think I have to provide the names, but what I'll have to do in here, I'll have to say that this is a constant character, right? So this is C in, uh, C character. And does the function self return anything? I didn't think it returns anything. Can I have something like that? I wonder. I'm not a I'm not a Rust developer, right? So I know nothing about Rust. So and that's the question I'm interested in. So uh, let's go, over. right? And uh, so here, this entire thing is supposed to return that, I suppose, and it's also supposed to accept that. Okay. Uh, now I need to create a function for the callback. JLW error. Uh, callback, right? So, and we accept something called uh, C int in here. Uh, to, 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 to. Uh, to, 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 to. Introduction to API LW set error callback. Uh huh. Okay, so the first thing is the error code and then the description. Okay, so this is going to be a code C int. Uh, and the description. This is going to be the description const uh, c char. There we go. Const c char. Cool. Mm -mm. So after that, maybe we want to actually print something. Uh, we could try to panic. 
<laughs> if you panic, will it start unwinding this stack, by the way? If I panic in here, will it start unwinding the stack? I think it will, right? It also depends on what kind of panicking you compiled your application with, because you can panic uh, by starting unwinding the stack, or you can also panic by aborting everything, and that will not unwind the stack. I think there is an option for, for, for that in Rust. I remember that. Rust, uh, panic, uh, panic, uh, abort. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the classical, we solved that in Nightly. Yeah, 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 fucking classic. Anyway, so what's funny is... <laughs> this is the funniest thing. I'm programming in Rust on the stream since, I think, 2016. So it's been five years. And every time I program in Rust and I encounter some sort of problem, the, the actual response... Oh, we solved that in Nightly. You guys are solving that in Nightly for five years. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I was doing... Um, <laughs> everything is done but in Nightly. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, unrecoverable errors with panic, uh, unwinding the stack or abort uh, in response to panic. Uh, okay, so... Alright, so you can do that in cargo, but what if I don't use the cargo? No respect for people, uh, cargo... Not, no, cargo not using people. <laughs> I don't know. We can take a look at the uh, the things. So Rust, uh, Rust C help, right? So the Rust C help. Mm -hmm. uh, so unwind, abort, and it doesn't even say that. Uh, so what if I put a Rust C? Maybe it said something in there, but I just literally don't see it. I literally don't see it. Uh, okay. Panic abort. Okay, so there's uh, saying something about that. Uh, C panic strategy. Okay, let's assume a target with no unwinding. Uh, so minus C panic abort. Okay, so that's probably what we want to do in here. It's probably what we want to do in here. Um, okay, so but first I want to actually panic like normally, right? So JLFW error, uh, right? Something like this, and I'm gonna just do like that. Uh, and I have a pointer in here, and I wonder how I can construct a string out of that. So, uh, C string. Mm, C string. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I wonder if I can just do CSTR, because I don't really need to own this thing, I just want to borrow it. Right, can I just do from point? Okay, I can do that from pointer, and uh, yeah. Uh, that's cool. Uh, so CSTR from PTR description. Can I do something like that? Uh, so it returns me CSTR. And then uh, I can probably do something like 2STR to uh, print it properly. But maybe it can print it like that. I don't know. Maybe they implemented like a display interface for this thing. Uh, okay. Uh, C string, CSTR. Uh, and they did not, so I have to do two string and also unwrap this entire thing. Uh, and uh, code is unused, I'm not going to be using it right now at least. Uh, maybe I can use it right now, why not? Uh, so I can just put the code in here. Right, so this is going to be the thing that I want to have in here. And uh, call to unsafe function. Okay, so can I just call this entire thing unsafe? Uh, all right, so everything seems to be compiling. Uh, and yeah, it couldn't create the window because we set up unreasonable thing in here, which is fine. So the next thing I want to do, I want to try to do jlfw set error callback, right? So can I set it right before initializing everything? That's actually very interesting. jlfw um, JLW error callback, finally. Okay, so will that work? So expected normal event found unsafe event. Oh, okay. So um, ah, let's actually put this in here. Why not? Let's actually pretend that we're safe, okay? Right, we're going to be pretending that we're safe. Not really being safe, but pretending. So people will think that we know what we're doing. Uh, anyway, so uh, what do we have in here? And uh, okay, JLW. Oh my god, this is this works? Fail to create context. 
uh, bad fb config. So the error is unhelpful, but at least it did something, which is nice. Right, and it didn't really fuck up the uh, runtime, but maybe it potentially can fuck it up. So we have to do something like panic abort, I suppose, right? So, and yeah, comp compilation aborted or something. So now it just aborted without unwinding or anything, and that's probably what we're going to be using. Mm -mm. Okay. So. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right, seems to be working, seems to be twerking. And if I put 3.3 three in here, right, the context that I support, um, yeah, so everything seems to be working. So maybe because of that, I don't really have to check for anything in here, right? So essentially, if any JLFW error happens, uh, if any of this shit happens, it will crash the application anyway, because it will jump to uh, here and it will panic and it will abort, right? So we'll make sure that we abort him in here. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, ga. so I removed this entire thing and I want to actually test the entire stuff in here. Uh, all right, so this is going to be something like this. So in here, I won't be able to run the application. So it's going to be main open GL. And uh, yeah, it's aborted and uh, ex the display environment variable is missing. Okay, so we even have a human readable errors in here. How cool is that? Yeah, so the error code is kind of weird, but I mean, yeah, it's fine. Maybe it's, it's useless, but we have a human readable errors in here. So cool. Mm -mm. So, uh, two, 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 two. Mm. the next thing we need to do, we have the right context for OpenGL, and I suppose we are ready to do some OpenGL, right? I, I guess we're ready to do some OpenGL. So the first thing we're going to do with the OpenGL, we're going to create another, uh, you know, external block in here, right? And the most two important functions, like before hello world, uh, of OpenGL. So hello world of OpenGL is a rainbow triangle, but before hello world of OpenGL, you can put some sort of like colored screen with two functions, GL clear uh, color and uh, right, GL clear uh, color and GL clear. So we need to have at least these two functions. Mm -mm -mm. Does GLFW serve the similar purpose as I'm GUI? No, it doesn't. They're not even comparable. So uh, let's go to OpenGL and uh, let's find the definitions of this function. So this is going to be clear color. Uh, and let's put this thing in here. Oh, look, we have a lot of OpenGL uh, types in here. So maybe we can define them uh, in here. So what is clump? What is clump? Uh, it is float. OK, so let's actually define it as F32. Maybe you can have something like C float. Is that a thing you can have in here? So it's going to be C float. It is a thing in here. So how is it defined? Uh, it's defined as F32. So let's actually do C float. And uh, let's import this entire thing from here. OK, so here is the C float. And we have a uh, gel clump gel clump and uh there we go so gel clear well i mean of course we have to do a little bit of an emacs magic before we can can you do that i don't think so meet oh got him got him oh got him all right so uh now uh, it's gonna be a fan gel clear and we'll have to have a mask which is just unsigned integer and i wonder in here, do we have u? Yeah, we do have a u int. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, gl bit field uh, field c u int c u int. Uh huh. Gl clear doesn't return anything. So we have two functions in here, and essentially, uh, I pull the events. Right, I pull everything. Then I'm going to do a gl clear color, and I'm going to set it to the color of the communism, the red one. All right, and then we can do gl clear, and we have to specify what buffer are we cleaning. So uh, we only care about gl color uh, buffer bit, 
right so but we don't know the value of this shit so what i need to do here i need to find this thing and just put it in here right along with other constants you see we're pulling out the constants that we care about so this one is going to be a gl bit field right so this is the constant there we go so and can i try to compile this entire thing it does not compile because of course this is not c uh what else do we have in here cu int we need to import cu int import in cu int and what's going to be the next thing? Everything seems to be okie dokie karaoke. And now it failed with a linkage. What the fuck is going on? Well, we're not linking with OpenGL. This is the second dependency that I need in here. So let's take a, uh, take a look. So it's going to be list all, grab uh, i, OpenGL. Is there something like OpenGL-ish? I think it's just gl, package config uh, libs, gl. Oh, it's, it's like a big JL. Okay, so extern uh, and I'm going to say uh, link, right? So this is going to be the link, JL uh, and there we go, seems to be, there we go. It's compiling, but it doesn't work. Well, because we're using unsafe blocks, that's why it compiled, but didn't work. I do understand that, but um, we need to understand what the hell is going on. So uh, the thing is, uh, the thing is, uh, we didn't swap the buffers. We rendered into the buffer, but we didn't swap the buffer. Uh, so uh, swap uh, gl. This is not a swap buffer. Swap interval. Um, so where is the to, to just swap buffers? There we go. That's the function we need. Not the function we deserve, but the function we need for sure. So let's actually put it in here. So that's going to be that. And this is going to be the mutable thing. There we go. And then I'm going to do glfw swap buffers. Uh, swap buffers window. There we go. Is it going to compile? Is it going to work? I have a working OpenGL application. But of course, the haters, the dollars will say, but it's unsafe, think about the children, oh my god, they might be watching your stream and picking up bad habits, oh, children must be afraid of computers, computers are banned. But yeah, it's, it's working. Um, Daphne Bag uh, Bandit, thank you so much for uh, Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome to our epic and safe club. That's right. We are the bad people. Right. Anyways, so um, it, it's, and look at that code, 75 lines of code. I mean, I, I mean, come on. No cargo, no shit ton of useless wrappers and abstractions. Only 75 lines of code, simple OpenGL application that can output things on the screen. I mean, is, is that cool? It's like, it's kind of cool. It's like, whatever. So, um, I guess the next thing we'll need to do, we'll need to, uh, you know, um, Start compiling shaders and shit, right? So uh, we'll need to pull uh, more OpenGL uh, functions. To, to be fair, we're we're kind of done with GLFW, right? So in terms of like GLFW, we don't really need more, except maybe we um, could add some controls, like a keyboard controls or something. That would be nice. So because I like to quit the application on pressing Q. Uh, so and in GLW, as far as I know, it's done by the uh, the, the callback. Right? GLW set keyboard uh, keyboard. Well, I mean key callback. Okay. Okay. So you have to have that, but you also need to have the key function, right? So holy shit, what the fuck is this? Um, thank you, C. Very cool. Like, is it possible in C to have? I think it is possible in C to have the argument names in here. It's just the, the creators of the uh, of the library decided not to put the names in there, right? So it's kind of cringe, not gonna lie. Anyway, so uh, at least they documented it, they documented them in here, right? At least they documented them in here, and that's fine, I guess. Mm, 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 mm. So. 
Oh shit, I just remembered something. Aren't you supposed to mark a callback as extern as well? <laughs> Why Russ didn't warn me about that? Like, I mean, I mean, okay. I, I guess it does make sense. Okay, let's actually just in case put, put extern in here, because <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, oh, and now in extern is a part of the type, sort of speak. Right, so let's actually... <laughs> it's actually quite surprising that it's working. So we're doing all of the, like, crazy unsafe shit, right? Uh, well, I mean, which which is fine, we're doing unsafe. Uh, but the compiler doesn't even warn us about that. But we're doing that outside of the unsafe blocks, that's the thing. Aren't we doing that? Yeah, because this thing is outside of the unsafe block and it's just like... But inside of external, I think it automatically considered unsafe, right? Okay, it's so very well then. Uh, so... Okay, so cool. Just in case, let's actually mark everything as external. You know, just in case. Mm, at least the Rostonomicon test tells us to that you have to do that. Um, okay. Mm, 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 mm. All right. You're on your own, kid. Oh no, I'm so scared. Oh no. Oh. You have to be scared of computer. If you want to be a programmer in 2021, you have to be scared of computer. <laughs> Imagine that. Holy shit. That's such a weird mindset, isn't it? Right. Like a training the whole generation of programmers to be afraid of computer. Uh, it's like training firefighters to be afraid of fire. I mean, certainly the safety measures are important and that's what you have to teach firefighters. But on top of safety measure, also teaching them to be afraid of fire. Well, I mean, it's kind of the opposite of what you, I, I don't quite understand. So it's kind of strange. Mm, extern without ABI means extern Rust or extern C. I have no idea, to be fair. So the extern in, uh, in Rust is extremely confusing. Um, I remember I had to put extern C when I was... Uh, writing WebAssembly application in Rust and I had to interface with JavaScript. So, <laughs> that was weird. Um, um, how is Rust still a useful approach using it this way? Useful compared to what? I mean, people use unsafe for several reasons, and that's fine. I'm just wondering why you wouldn't use C in the first place. Or is this the point showing you can do all of that without cargo in Rust? My project is already written in Rust. So... <laughs> okay. Um, so... Some people don't understand that you have a project in a particular language and you, it's kind of pointless that you, if you jump between the languages, you, you pick a language and you write a project in that language and you have to deal with the problems of that language. Um, if I switch to C, I will be dealing with different problems and then somebody else will come in and tell, and tell me how is C is a useful approach? Why don't you just rewrite in Rust? I rewrite it in Rust, I have some problems and other person comes in. How is Rust a still useful approach? Rewrite it in C. And I'm going to be just ping-ponging between the languages, right? Is, is that how you see the situation, right? Anyways. Uh... <laughs> Here's the simple thing, people. People! All of that shit doesn't fucking matter. It's just that it doesn't fucking matter. Look, 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 look. I have a window that outputs a red square. If I didn't tell you that it's written in Rust with you without using cargo, if it's shut on of unsafe, you wouldn't even care. Nobody cares. You know what matters is what you what you're capable of putting up on the screen. There's like very simple criteria of a programmer. You're either capable of putting up the red square on the screen or you don't. Everything else doesn't fucking matter. Nobody gives a shit. Seriously. Nobody gives a shit. I'm really sorry to tell you that. It's just like 
but I'm sorry cr for crushing your dreams, but it's just like doesn't fucking matter. You either have a red uh, a red square or you don't. Just how it is. I do have a red square. Do you have a red square? I don't think so. Anyway, so let's make a small break. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because I want to make a cup of tea. Uh, so, and after the break, we're going to continue. I have a magenta square. Well, I mean, it's almost as red square, but with additional blue. Oh, that's so cool. Anyway, so uh, let's make a small break. Um, um. All right. Let's finish this off. So the next thing we we'll probably want to do is to create a shader. As far as I know, in OpenGL there's a function called GL create. Oh, fuck! I think it's available in GL XT. Okay, so um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we can theoretically do that, uh, but it's kind of like not the way you're supposed to do that. Okay, so um, we need a glu int, and I can say something like glu int. It's cu int, uh, right? So it returns glu int. Was it glu int? I think it was glu int. And then we're gonna have a gl in num, uh, and gl in num is what? Gl in num. Uh, so where is it defined? I think it's defined somewhere in here. Gl in num. So it's also you int, right? So it's also you int. There we go. Um, so this is gonna be something like that. Oh my god, the classic. The classic. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. Okay, so uh, here's the problem. So as far as I know, um, functions that you find in GL extensions are considered like part of extensions. And uh, you should not link statically linked against them. So mm -mm -mm, you should not statically linked against them uh, because uh, you may end up with an executable that is not portable across different environments. At least this is how I understand the situation. Right. So essentially, it's usually like, you know, um, I guess designed for, for the games, right? So OpenGL is like more of a game thing and uh, games are usually closed source. So the developers usually ship the final executables. So, um, and uh, to make the executable portable across different environments with different versions of OpenGL, you're supposed to load this extension functions dynamically. Seriously, this is not a joke. You're supposed to be loading them dynamically. Your executable is supposed to uh, load OpenGL uh, library in whatever operating system it is of, of whatever version of, of OpenGL and then check within the OpenGL what kind of version it is and what kind of extensions it supports and only them load them up and just uh, find the addresses of the procedures of these functions and use those functions. So uh, not only you have to um, link with them dynamically but you have to do a lot of dynamic loading yourself. That is intended way of working with OpenGL and OpenGL extensions. I'm not even joking. So uh, in GLFW, to make it a little bit more cross-platform, there is uh, a function uh, called GLFW uh, find um, get proc. Yeah, get proc address. Yeah, this is literally it. So uh, yeah returns an address of a specified function for the current context. So you literally have to call this function like this, right? So you get a function, it accepts string, look, 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 it accepts string. Uh, and uh, so you have to do gl create uh, shader and it will return you a pointer, a function pointer that you have to use for gl create shader. So, and you also have to specify all of the signatures and stuff like that. So this is the intended way of working with OpenGL because again, uh, usually people who work with OpenGL, they want to create a portable executables that can work across several environments. They can check dynamically what's available. If something is not available, they're going to use a different way and so on and so forth. It's a very dynamic system and stuff like that. So uh, because of that, uh, people created like a lot of OpenGL loaders like GLUW, uh, glue, right? So this is a function that basically automates that process for you. 
some wado subscribed at tier one thank you thank you so much for uh, tier one subscription i really appreciate it so this is additional library that you have to use uh, that automates this process of tedious loading of all of these functions and checking if something supported or not right so essentially opengl is a cross-platform graphics api but it doesn't have a cross-platform way of creating a window. So on top of OpenGL, you also need a library that creates a window, GLFW. But OpenGL is also a very dynamic system. So uh, you also need OpenGL module. So, so you need at least three uh, different libraries to, to work with OpenGL. Um, mm -mm. Um, so, but here's an interesting thing. Um, we can go down that rabbit hole, sure. And it could be even interesting to some extent. But here's an interesting thing. You still low, uh, you, you still can link against those functions statically. You still can do that. It's totally fine, trust me. And it's gonna work. But the problem is that it is going to work only on your machine, probably. Right. So because you're going to end up with an executable that uh, expects this set of functions and nothing else. And if you try to run it on a different machine, it may not work. But again, this is kind of stuff that is needed for proprietary closed source software. Right. So our application is open source. If it compiles on your machine with your version of OpenGL, it will work there. So. The problem of creating a, a portable executable uh, for OpenGL application is not really a problem that we're faced with right now. You see what I'm talking about? So the, all of this needed is to solve the problem of making portable executable, as far as I can understand, by the way. I'm not a uh, you know, game developer or like a graphics person or something, but I looked into this situation, read some docs, some articles, and this is how I understand the entire dynamic situation with OpenGL. So, and I suppose the entire thing is designed to solve the problem of portable executables, but we're not creating portable executable. Our thing is open source. We're not shipping executable, we're shipping the source code that you're supposed to compile yourself. So because of that, it's not a problem for us. We don't have to use any of these libraries and we don't have to do dynamic, a dynamic thing. We can just link statically. And if it compiles and links on your machine, it will work on your machine. Sounds good, sounds reasonable. Uh, and maybe this is something that we can put a note about, uh, right? And in the future implement dynamic loading because with dynamic loading, you have to have a lot of repetitive code that loads the stuff and then checks if it's fine or not. And that could be a pretty good opportunity to use the Rust macros, right? To sort of like wrap it up, uh, wrap up the repetitive code into a macro. So it automatically does a lot of stuff for you. So yeah. Does anyone have questions about this kind of stuff? Does it make sense? Or maybe somebody has corrections. Maybe we have professional OpenGL developers in the chat. Uh, uh. Make sense? I guess it makes sense. Sounds reasonable, at least to me. Mm. What are the three modules you need with OpenGL? Three modules, you mean libraries? I already mentioned them, GLFW, some sort of a loader, glue or glad, uh, and OpenGL itself. Right. Mm, so yeah, the thing that you need, uh, you need a way to create a window, create window library, right? So uh, that's the thing you need. Uh, and uh, to create a window, we have uh, such options as GLFW. Uh, you have an option of GLUT. Uh, you have an option of SDL, or you can do a direct native, uh, you know, direct, uh, direct native um, API, which is uh, WGL on Windows, right? On Windows, um, mm, GLX. Uh, GLX on Linux and something on Mac OS. I don't remember what was what's on Mac OS. So I think it's like oh my god, uh, Cocoa. Is that is that what you use for for initialization of window? Uh, I don't quite remember, but uh, but anyway, so something on Mac OS. 
uh, something on macOS. So this is what you need. You will have to pick depending on the situation what you want, right? So it, it's just like it's, it's only to create a window. It's only to create a window. Then you need to be able to uh, load extensions, right? Load extensions because of the reasons I just explained. I'm not going to explain them uh, one more time. If you missed it, please, you know, rewind. So uh, to load extensions, you need something like GLU and I think also GLAD, uh, right? And the open uh, GL itself, right? So you need these three things. You need a way to create a window, load extensions and open GL itself. So uh, what I personally found is that it's not really difficult to load things yourself. And a lot of these things, specifically SDL and GLFW, provide you a way to find a prestigious address um, of the function in a cross-platform way that works on all the operating systems. So you can kind of like do this part yourself. It's going to be a little bit tedious, a little bit tedious, but uh, it's going to be worth it because you then you don't have additional set-party dependency that you don't really need. So, and also EGL, there's also EGL as far as I know. I, I never tried EGL, so, but I heard that it's like a new, brand new way of initializing wind, uh, like OpenGL. They're going to save your life. Anyway, whatever. So, um, let's continue. So we're gonna create that and I'm gonna just directly like link against these things for the reasons I just explained. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, all right, so that worked. And uh, now uh, let's try to call GL create shader, right? GL create shader. Mm, all right, so it's gonna be, um, I think I have to go to the extensions. Uh, GL, I think you have to specify the type of the shader, right? So something like vertex shader. Yeah, there we go. So you have a fragment shader and a vertex shader. Uh, okay, so let's go back to open GL. Mm -mm -mm. So it's going to be GL in num. Uh, let's put this stuff in here. And this is going to be const uh, GL in num. Uh, GL in num. And this one is going to be GL in num. Uh, two, two, two. Okay, so and now I want to go ahead and create a vertex shader. GL vertex shader, and this one is going to be let vert shader. There we go. And we can also log that shader right away. Create it uh, vertex shader uh, like this. And this is going to be the ID of the vertex shader we managed to create. And of course, we have to do vert shader. Uh, okay, so created vertex shader one. Okay, that's pretty cool. What about creating a fragment shader? So this is going to be frag shader and this one's going to be fragment shader. So uh, fragment shader, because usually you need like two kinds of shader, uh, you know, vertex shader and fragment shader. So did we manage to create both of them? Uh, well, that is interesting. So both of them are one, which is kind of, oh, this is because I copy pasted this entire thing, of course. This is because I copy pasted this entire thing. Here we go. So we have a, a vertex shader one and vertex shader two. So we created two shaders. Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting. Mm. So, um, cool. Uh, after that, we'll need to attach some source code to the shaders. Um, right. So I don't quite remember uh, how to do that. I think it's something like GL uh, shaders. Yeah. Oh my God. This one is going to be fun. Look at that. We're going to have a lot of fun translating that to Rust. Look at that. Yes. It's a pointer, const pointer to const pointer to char. Yes. That's a very, very cool function, but let's not be afraid. A lot of people would be afraid of this kind of function and go into boohoo mode, just use the binding. But we're not going to go into that mode because we're not scared of pointers, right? We're not scared of pointers. Okay. So uh, here we're uh, accepting the shader, right? So we're going to do GLU size and then GL size I. So that's the things we're going to be accepting in here. So do we have a GL size I? All right, so uh, let's go. So this is just an integer, right? Type GL size I and uh, just an integer. Okay, this one is interesting. So this is a 
const pointer to const pointer to char. So as far as I know, in Rust, you actually define it like this. So it's a const pointer to const pointer to gl char. There we go. So, and I suppose here, uh, gl char, uh, gl char, uh, it's not even defined here. Is it defined in extensions? That's really weird. Oh, that is very interesting. GL char, um, GL char was defined in OpenGL extensions because before you never had to pass a string into OpenGL. Um, yeah, that's actually interesting. <clears throat> Strange API, most people just upload the whole source code in one chunk, so count is always one. Most of people, who, whom exactly are you talking about? Uh, maybe there is a, a game engine that actually uh, uses this kind of functionality. All right, so that way you can upload several files uh, at once, right? So maybe you have a system which uh, loads several files into the array and With that function you can just without any preprocessing just put them in there um, Especially it could be useful for maybe for including or concatenating files, right? So you don't really have to create uh, Like load two files create additional buffer that fits both of the files and copy it there You don't have to do that. You can just load two files and just pass them as an array of two pointers. So you never have to concatenate them or anything. So basically concatenation is done by the uh, by the OpenGL. I never used this kind of thing myself, but I can imagine um, that this is how it can be used. The churn and thin matrix do it. Who? Uh, so uh, let's continue. <clears throat> so this is a char. Uh, C char. Uh, two, 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 two. So we accepted that. So here's the pointer, and the length is going to be also like this. I wonder if I can do something like. Eh, didn't work. Uh, oh, I have an idea. Wait a second. Can I do something like. Huh. All right. Maybe, maybe not. I was thinking about a better way to do this kind of stuff. Uh, to, 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 to. So, gel shader source. Shader source. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's attach the shader, the vert shader. Mm -hmm. So, here's the shader. So, the count in our case is going to be one, of course. Uh, so, and then we'll have to. Well, length is probably going to be also null to indicate that it's a, a null terminated thing. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, let me think. We probably will have to wrap it into a C string, right? So, uh, let, me, let me find the uh, documentation for the C string. Chat, what do you think about C string? Did I ask that? Uh, all right. So um, source vert source c string new uh, version three three core uh, new line does must have a row string string uh, literals. I think it has something like that. Mm, 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 mm. Row strings. You know what? Uh, I'm gonna just like use the proper documentation. Uh, is there like a reference? Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's search for row string uh, literals. Row bytes. Okay. So there's something in here. Uh huh. Oh, it's just like this shit. Uh, I think I vaguely remember that you can put this thing in here, but they're talking about B. So, but this, this is not really byte, row byte string. Uh, mm, uh, eh, row string. Oh my god, it's so slow. Uh, character and string literals. I think that's the thing. Yeah, I can put a new line in here. Row string. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I wanted this shit. 
Yes, 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 go away freaking this one. Okay, so that means I can do something like uh, R, uh, like this. And can I just put it like that? Um, yeah, I can give it a try. Okay. So, and then avoid main, right? And uh, we're not going to do anything in here, right? So this is going to be just like this, right? Uh, and I'm thinking, am I going to you know, indent this in any way. I think I, I could indent it just in case. There we go. So when I'm constructing a C string, right? So C string returns the result and it can fail. So, uh, to do, to do, I guess I can just unwrap it, right? So the cool thing about C string is that it now I can just take the source, right? I can just take, take the source, vert source as PTR, and that will return me the uh, the pointer, right? So I think it has to be mutable or something in here, right? And uh, let's see. So it's not compatible because, uh, yeah, similarly named type alias already defined, glu int already defined. Let me take a look at this thing, right? Um, Oh, GL int is not defined. Uh, this is very, very strange. GL extension and GL shader source. It is GL int. Okay. So we can define GL int by basically removing U. And is it going to work? Is it going to work? No, the shader is not in the source. It's a vert shader. And I want to see, yeah, so now it complains that we have a pointer, but we have to give pointer to pointer. So since both of them are constant, I think I should be able to just do that. And it will give me the right thing and it compiles. Easy. So, easy peasy lemon squeezy. We attached the source code of the shader that fucking easily. So after that, after we attach the source code of the shader, uh, right, what we need to do in here, we need to... I suppose compile this shit, right? So we have to do gel uh, compile shader, right? And uh, uh, there we go. Let's just go ahead and compile this shit. Oh, yeah, of course, I need to create a, uh, the binding. gel shader source. Uh, and in here, this thing is just the shader. There we go. gel uh, compile shader, vert shader. And let's just try to. Ah, Emacs, shut the fuck up, Emacs. Uh, works. So, and after that, we need to check the status of the compilation, right? So that's the classical thing to do. Uh, all right. So GL um, shader. I think it's a get shader. Uh, yeah, there we go. So that's the function that you need. And through that function, you can get the compilation status of the shader. And this is where we'll be able to actually test whether our you know, shader compiles or not. So uh, extern, so this is one of the externs and let's put it in here. So in here, we accept the shader of this type and then pin name, it's a parameter name of the shader, right? And uh, this is the output. So this is through which it will return us, you know, something. Uh, something that we care about. There we go. So, and the parameter name, uh, the only parameter name we care about is GL compile status. I, I guess that's one that we care about. GL compile status. So this is going to be const and uh, GL enum. Uh, is it GL enum? I think it's GL enum. Okay. So, uh, GL compile st um, GL get shader iv so vert shader uh, gl compile status and then we're gonna have a, a variable called compiled uh, compiled and um, this one has to be gl int uh, and it's initially gonna be zero maybe i don't even have to do that because there is some sort of like a type inference in um in rust as far as i know and then we can just do something like compiled right so if compiled uh, was zero, we can say uh, could not compile vertex shader. There we go. We couldn't compile the vertex shader, uh, but it didn't complain, so we could compile vertex shader. What if we put some garbage in here? Could not compile vertex shader. So we actually 
try compile it and if we could not it fails it works so the entire pipeline works so okay that's, that's pretty cool but on, on top of if, if it doesn't compile it would be nice to know what exactly happened if you know what i'm talking about right it would be nice to know so it's usually done with gl um, get shader in full log right so that's how it's usually done this one is a little bit uh more interesting right so it's a little bit more involved uh so let's go to extern and let's actually put this thing in here there we go so we got, are gonna accept the shader we're gonna accept the size of the buffer so now we have to allocate a buffer and give the pointer to that buffer to opengl right and then receive some data from opengl and display it for the user right so we're taking the safe memory and we give it to unsafe code and we have to be very very careful right very very careful uh okay so um yeah so the size of the buffer is this and then we accept the length of the buffer so this is going to be uh returned by opengl to us and this is the pointer to the buffer into which we're going to be saving all of that okay so that's basically the function that we have to use uh okay so uh let's go back in here and let's try to get that so here's the shader buffer size okay so let's allocate the buffer on the stack usually in um uh in c that buffer the info log buffer is allocated on the stack so uh let's put it like this it's gonna be buffer um let's call it info log why not uh and it's gonna be array right it's gonna be array uh, of c char so this is gonna be c char uh, and the size is going to be like one kilobyte. Usually people allocate one kilobyte and that's more than enough to uh, to store the error, right? So this one is going to be 0, 1, 24. Cool. So the buffer size, I suppose I want to do something like info log len. And length will return an actual size of the buffer, right? It will return an actual size. So we're going to do something like length, uh, gl size i, um, and show zero and uh we're gonna be passing it like this info log is a little bit more interesting so um i want to treat the array as a slice of characters right so by the way this is gl char and i probably want to do something like gl char there we go so just to, to, to match the types so in as far as i can remember in the slices of rust in the slices of rust it's actually a good name for yet another book about rust the slices of rust <laughs> Uh, all right, so here is the, where is the slice? Where is the slice? 50 slices of rust, yes. Um, SPTR, yeah. You can straight up take the slice and convert it to pointer. And this is probably what we can do right here. But we have to actually convert it to mutable and there is a mutable version of that. There we go. So essentially we can take our info log, right? Take our info log and say something like as mute PTR. There we go. So that should give us the, the pointer. Uh, and uh, let's try to compile this entire thing. Mm, does it compile? Does it compile? It doesn't compile. Uh, it's a vertex shader. There we go. It's a vertex shader. So, info log any code following this expression is unreachable. Thank you so much. Thank you, counter. Uh, so, len is. Okay, so expected i32. I'm gonna just go ahead and just do that. I know that this thing is so small that it's never gonna overflow i32, so there's no problem in here. Uh, so, oh, yeah, this one has to be mutable, of course sure whatever uh info cannot borrow info as mutable okay so let's also mark it as mutable sure and it seems to be working it seems to be twerking and it didn't even crash because we removed the panic all right so let's actually go ahead and do something like panic um could not compile vertex shader vertex shader and let's print the info log so we can treat info log as the buffer of bytes. As far as I know, I think uh, what uh, somebody donated something. Let, just uh, just a Thanks second. Thanks for the great content. 
Oh, you're welcome. Uh, just a second. I need to uh, find the Streamlabs just to see your full message. Uh, Denon BW, thank you for the great content. Uh, 12 uh, and 50 euros. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a generous donation. That's actually a decent amount of money for me uh, because I live in a third world country. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it. So, um, okay. So we need to create... Um, str from a slice right so that's what we need to do at least encode it in some way and i wonder if there is any constructors like from or something uh, so maybe there's something from row parts well i mean we don't really have a row parts we could use row parts uh from utf okay so i think that's the thing we can use in here from utf8 from UTF-8 and yeah, there we go, that's perfect. So it accepts the slice and just encodes it as UTF-8 and you can use that. So, but here's an interesting thing. Um, length, um, it has a limited length. We can use the slice syntax to do something like uh, like this, right? Because length contains the uh, like how much it actually filled. But there is also an assertion just in case because you never know uh, the code is unsafe. We want to double check that the length is within the size of the buffer and we don't really buffer overflow. Even if we buffer overflow, as far as I know, it doesn't really disable boundary checks in here, right? So unsafe doesn't really disable any boundary checks. And if it basically tries to overflow, this entire thing will just crash. Maybe there is no need to put that assertion in there because the rest will just you know do that for us. So maybe I'm not going to even worry about that. Okay. Uh, so... Um, mm, mm, mm. Is the info buffer null terminated? No, it's not. Uh, well, it is and it is not uh, as well. It just depends on whether you terminate it with null or not. I don't think it matters that much. So, str from... So, it's a method of str. Okay, so str from utf8. Uh, right. Str from utf8 and I can unwrap this entire thing. So, and let's see, is it gonna work? Uh, UTF-8, uh, okay. No function uh, from str, so I suppose I'll have to use std-str to actually have this function, do I? So it cannot be indexed by, okay, so that means here I have to convert it to use size, and is it gonna work? Wait a freaking second. U8. And GL char is defined as C char. And C char is defined. Wait, wait a freaking sec. Are you freaking serious? you do this <laughs> so c char i suppose it's a type that is designed for ffi with c right and it's i8 and then you have a function which is general function that allows you to construct uh the strings and it's u8 and it creates a friction between these two types that are supposed to actually come together. So, obviously, you want to use CHAR with the combination of ROM UTF-8. Obviously, that's like a very obvious use case. But you define CHAR as I8, and is there any good reason for that? Like, actually good reason to introduce this kind of fraction? Okay, equivalent to CHAR, uh, CHAR is complete unlike a Rust char type. Well, uh, Rust char is a completely different story. Well, Rust type represents Unicode uh, char. This type will always be either I8 or U... They don't even know which one they want, so they... Oh, it will be either one or one. We don't care. Like, whatever, right? So, it's just like, yeah, maybe we can change, but it's always gonna... Be... I mean, I don't know which one you have to use in this particular situation, 
but I think from the user usability perspective, this type has to be compatible with this because it's like a very uh, straightforward thing that you want to do. Right, you want to have a pointer to CHAR uh, and then use the result to, to construct a string. That makes sense to me at least. Unless I'm misunderstanding the purpose of CHAR, maybe I'm misunderstanding what, what you're supposed to use it with. But this is kind of like a, a little bit of a bug that introduces a freak frame between, uh, between Rust and C. So it's kind of it's kind of strange. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of yeah. So it's, it's a really unpleasant friction <laughs> that they have to deal with, because yeah, I, I use CHR and I would expect like being able to easily create things, but maybe you're not supposed to be creating Rust strings from C sources, right? You're supposed to be using C string and C str. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is because you're not supposed to be like doing it like that. You're supposed to be doing these things. Um, but this is not convenient. So I don't want to do like a loophole, loop, and uh, no, this is not convenient. So you can create this thing. Nah. Okay, so here's the thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say that this shit is gonna be U8. <laughs> this is so sad. Uh, okay, mismatched type and uh, because of that... Uh, oh, that's that creates a problem in another place. Okay, GL char. Well, in, in that case, I can just use it as the byte literal. Can I do br? Is that what I can do? Uh-huh. Uh, and then I have to use from bytes. Uh, annoying um <clears throat> thank you rust very cool so now as you can see it complains about uh things uh, within the shader right uh so it says something about uh, and it's because the zero terminator uh, uh oh okay so if i put something like this in here it still will not compile right uh because yeah so now it says that it doesn't know anything about this thing which means the compilation uh, process actually works correctly perfect so yeah we have a sequence of actions that allows us to compile a shader from the source code it's pretty cool and it also reports errors and shit so yeah we may want to encapsulate, like, factor that out into a separate functions because we're going to be repeating that for the fragment shader as well. Know what I'm talking about? So it would be nice to have some sort of a function like um, compile uh, shader uh, from source, right? And here we can specify the shader type, and it's going to be jail enumeration, and the shader source, uh, shader source. Uh, and it's going to be, I suppose, str, and this thing is going to return glu int, which is the, um, you know, the identifier of the shader. Oh boy! Uh, so let's compile this entire, uh, like, let's move this entire chunk of code into this function, right? Uh, and let's see. So I think I'm going to remove the vert prefix from everything in here, so there's no vert anymore. So we create a shader and uh, we're going to be creating it from the shader type. There we go. So shader source um, is this, but we need to turn it into a string, right? We need to turn it into a string. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to call this source and this source sister. Yes, this is going to be source sister. Uh, right, and in here we're going to be use source sister sptr, 
uh, then we compile the shader, then we check that compilation status is OK. Uh, and uh, then we say that we couldn't compile the shader. It would be kind of nice to um, uh, say what kind of shader we have in here. Uh, so maybe we can do something like um, shader uh, name, shader type name, right? And this one is going to be the shader type. So we can have a function that basically translates the shader type to a particular string uh, that we want to print for the user. So shader type name, right? And it accepts shader type, uh, gl in num. Uh, and it will return you, I suppose, static string, right? Because the, all of that is going to be, is going to have a lifetime of the whole application anyway. So I'm going to match shader type. Uh, and we, here we're going to have a gl shader, gl vertex shader. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and this is going to be just a vertex. And then we're going to have a fragment. Uh, fragment. And otherwise, uh, unknown or something. Let's see? So there we go. So that's what we're going to have in here. Mm -hmm. uh, do, 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 do. And yeah, so this one has to actually accept the source like this, right? Because we're converting it to a string. Um, and yesu, 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 kawaii freaking desu. So now I want to create a vertex shader, right? And for the vertex shader, uh, I'm gonna be moving this entire thing like that. Compile shader from source. From source. Gel vertex shader. Boom. And now I can remove all of that crap from here because I don't care about it. I literally don't give a shit about crap. Uh, okay. Is, is that a good code? Is that a good code? I think it's. I think it's fine. So, and I want to repeat the same thing for the fragment shader, right? So we want to compile both of them, vertex and fragment shader, right? So this is going to be fragment. And uh, every time we use vert, uh, this is going to be frag. There we go. And this one has to be a fragment shader. There we go. So we have a special function that compiles both of the shaders and it doesn't compile itself because a semicolon, of course. Uh, do we have anything else? Another semicolon. Don't copy paste code kits. Uh, uh, and do we have anything else in here? If compiled, uh, expected jill you int. I forgot to return the shader. What else do we have in here? Uh, unused variable, uh, the other one, jill create, unsafe function. Okay, so this function is going to be unsafe. Unsafe function is unsafe. Okay, it compiles. Perfect. It's interesting that it's created like this one for the fragment shader, which is kind of sus. That means we call create shader. Yeah, there we go. Uh, there we go, there we go. So we should be actually using that slightly different one, like this, right? Uh -huh. Now it works. Okay, we created both of the shaders. Cool. Compiled both of the shaders. So the next thing we need to do, we need to link the shaders into the shader program. So since we already established the pattern of, uh, you know, compiling, like having functions that compile shaders, we might as well have a function that link the shaders. You know what I'm talking about? Something like unsafe fn uh, link uh, shaders into program. And the thing is, it's going to accept a slice of shaders, right? So it's going to be slice that accepts GLU int and returns you a new program, newly linked program, right? So that way you can uh, actually provide more than two shaders, like three or five or whatever, and all of them are going to be linked into a single program. So that's basically the idea in here. Um, uh, and I guess we're going to do that after a small break because I'm actually a little bit tired already. So let's put it to doing here to implement this entire thing. But we're already getting closer. We already compiled a bunch of shaders. We already compiled them. We just need to link them. And once we link them, once we link them, maybe we'll be able to execute something on GPU. How about that? So, uh, yeah, everything seems to be okay. All right, so let's make some break. Um, 
All right, let's continue. Uh, we need to link a program. To link a program, first thing we need to do, we need to create a program, right? Uh, so gl create program. Uh, to, 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 so let's take a look at the extern, right? So and and as you can see, we don't even use that many open gel functions anyway. But we're already compiling shaders, right? We're already compiling shaders, which is kind of cool. A gel create program. So this thing is supposed to return gel you int. Um, and, Mm -hmm. So this thing accepts that, and there we go, we, we created the program. So uh, link program, so let gl create program, uh, and this is going to be the program that we're creating, uh, and uh, we're going to be also returning that program as well. So the next step in linking the program is to actually attach the shader. I think it's literally, oh yeah, I can already see that it's like somewhere here. Uh, you attach the shader. Uh, dredge dredge thank you so much for Great two months thank you thank you so much uh thank you for two months of tier one subscription thank you and really appreciate the support uh thank you thank you thank you so here's the function that we need all right so this is going to be that uh and fn uh ah, yeah <laughs> sorry uh i'm getting a little bit tired so um I'm starting to make a lot of mistakes. So now we want to attach all of the shaders to our program, right? So that's what we want to do. Uh, so we're going to be iterating through all of the shaders uh, in shaders, right? And we're going to be attaching all of them to the program. Here's the program. Here's the shader. There we go. All of the shaders have been successfully attached. So after you attach all of the shaders, you want to try to link your program, right? Yeah, there we go. Link a program. Uh, boom, boom, and uh, there we go. And it's the same situation as with the uh, with the shaders, right? You want to check the linking status, right? Uh, because linking of the program can also fail. So it's kind of weird that it like shader compilation also inherits this C model, where you have these translation units that you have to link together but it is what it is it's kind of difficult to i suppose to get out of that mindset if you've been c developer for quite some time right you basically start um projecting the c compilation model to everywhere including like gpus and stuff like that so yeah i don't know i'm not sure if all of that is really th that necessary in here to be fair i personally would like to just have a single shader <laughs> for everything like i want it to be both a fragment shader and a vertex shader and i want to include like everything into single one thing but maybe because i never actually wrote any big significant OpenGL applications and maybe that's why i want to do that i don't know not really that experience with OpenGL. <clears throat> anyway so we link the program right so uh let's actually see if this entire thing compiles but before we can do that i think we need to try to call this function. So first of all, we compile vertex shader, then the fragment shader. And what we can do in here is just link them together. But what Rust allows you to do that C doesn't is just like inline create array, uh, vert shader, frag shader, and then uh, give a pointer to that or reference, right? And then you can just basically link uh, both of them together and create the final program. So this is actually extremely convenient, at least syntactically, because in C you would have to allocate the stack, uh, the array on the stack and just put all of these shaders in there. Uh, so it's, it's syntactically more nice, whether it's semantically gives you like huge of an advantage, it's kind of there. Mm, so it uses vertex shader. Yeah, it is a mistake. It is in fact a mistake. We'll have to fix that some point maybe not, not right now i don't want to fix it right now we're gonna fix it later okay so uh let's continue so this is the shader and uh i have to dereference this entire thing okay so it seems to be working it seems to be working uh so and now i need to check the linking status i think it's a gl get program iv uh Okay, so here's the function. So uh, I'm gonna put it in here. Mm, so it accepts the program, then it accepts the parameter that we care about, and then it accepts the output argument into which we, um, you know, output the thing. 
So, and the parameter that we care about is uh, the compilation status, right? So let's uh, put it somewhere there. So we have a, not really compilation status, linking status. There we go, that's what we care about. We care about linking status. Uh, GL enumeration of our animation. Oh, there we go. Uh, link shader, there we go. Mm, get program. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So we provide the program, then we provide the link status, right? So this is a link status, and then we need to have something like linked, right? And initially it's going to be zero, right? And so it will be immutable linked. And if linked equal to zero, we're going to say panic could not link the shader program. Ooh. Okay, and then we're gonna return that. Let's see if it's gonna work. And there we go. It panics. It couldn't link the shader program. So, and my suspicion is because of the two vertex shaders. That's my suspicion. But we don't know that for sure because we don't know what's the actual error message of the uh, linkage. So let's actually uh, don't fix anything first. Let's finish implementation of error reporting and confirm that the error is because of the two vertex shaders. Sounds good? Sounds good. I think it's going to be even educational. Uh, okay, so to get the error, we need to do gl get uh, program infolog. It's really similar to get a shader infolog. It's like literally the same signature and maybe we'll, we'll be able to even copy paste this code. Uh, and we already actually tested this code. We already know that there is a little bit of friction between CHAR and U8. So we're not going to encounter that again. Uh, you see, so this kind of binding writing is tedious, but you more, the more you write the binding, the more you develop like this machinery that helps you to smooth out and speed up the binding development. Yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of develop, uh, making their own bindings, um, thinking that it's hard. But if you try to do that for at least once, you would discover something interesting about writing your own bindings. The process of writing them is speeding up. The more you write, the more you develop these tools that help you to actually do that quicker and quicker and quicker. And at some point, it's just like, yeah, copy pasting function. Using function, copy pasting, it's just super fast, right? At the beginning, it's slow because you don't really know what kind of challenges you will, uh, you know, uh, face. But as you face more and more challenges and as you solve them, you develop like this sort of like a car on which you can run faster and faster. And that's basically what's going on here. Uh, so, <clears throat> now... Um, yeah, so we need to put this entire thing in here. But, uh, <clears throat> mm, so it would be nice if it be possible to make the whole function set. It would be, but uh, it will actually slow down the process of getting uh, things done. In the sense that I want to first have a working application, right? Uh, and then uh, once I have something working, then we can go through the code one more time and see how we can tighten it up, like in which places we can get rid of unsafe, right? In which places we cannot get rid of unsafe and so on and so forth. It's kind of difficult to mix up the process of writing something that is working and tidying things up. It's kind of like really difficult because they're conflicting things, right? So first, I personally like to write something something that works with as little friction as possible. And once I see that, okay, this is a good thing and it is working, we can tighten it up, we can make it safer, we can clean things up, uh, because now I know that thing is working and it can clean up things uh, incrementally and just monitor whether I'm breaking things or not. See? So that's how I usually do that. Um, <clears throat> So I personally think Rust kind of makes this sort of workflow really difficult because Rust always wants you to do these two things simultaneously. It really wants you to, uh, you know, experiment and develop things and tidy them up simultaneously, which in my opinion, are very conflicting things, right? And that's why Rust is really like, you know, has a lot of friction. So because it wants you to do conflicting things simultaneously. Um, at least that's my perception of Rust. I don't know. Like, eh. mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I, I've been programming in Rust since 2016, on and off. So I made breaks for like a year or two, but occasionally, like, I'm programming in it for like since 2016, and I still think 
it introduces too much friction for my taste. I still, for my taste, it introduces too much friction. So I've been probing for a while and it just didn't really change. My opinion didn't really change. Uh, so, yeah. Safety and uh, stability is a very important concern. It is a valid concern and it is very, very important. But I think you need to address this concern after you already know what you're developing. Because quite often when you start developing thing, you don't fully really know what you're developing because you're writing a code and you're experimenting. Because you have an idea, you implemented the idea and the idea turned out not the thing you want. So you need to actually tune your idea. You need to like, um, you know, pivot it to something else. And if the language doesn't allow you to do that freely and easily, it is really, really difficult and it kills the whole process, right? I like to just experiment with the thing, nail it down to what I want and then tighten it up. So, um, but Rust kind of like goes to in, a, in a different direction and, and uh, maybe it's just me, right? So maybe it, whatever Rust is doing works for other people. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so um, what I was doing. <clears throat> Git programming info log. Okay, so let's get, actually get it down. Uh, so this is going to be the buffer size. Right, and it's literally the same situation, actually. Oh. Oh. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, I don't remember that. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, start, start. Thank you so much for Twitch Pan subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Okay. So here's the info log and both of these things are mutable. Okay, so maybe I can even copy paste this entire chunk of code and just change some of the functions so I don't have to go through this entire design process of these four lines again, <laughs> right? Because it was a little bit painful. Um, so get uh, program info log, right? And then could not link, uh, link shader. Uh, shader program, right, and I can remove this entire thing, and there we go, so and then we return the program. Okay, let's see if that will break. Uh, so this is not a shader, this has to be a program. Uh, anything else? Is that this shit again? <laughs> Wait a second. Oh yeah, it is that shit again, because I should have, you yeah, know, should have used uh, U8 instead in here, right, because in here we're using U8, so for, for that specific case we have to use U8. Uh, and there we go. Uh, main is multiple, uh, multiple defined. Yes. So that's basically a good sign of, uh, you know, two shaders with the same type because you cannot duplicate function names within, uh, within the same kind of shader, right? So you can duplicate them in different kinds of shaders, but within the same kind of shader, you're not allowed to do that. So basically the, uh, the OpenGL caught this error, right? So if we change this to fragment, right? If we change it to fragment, it will now compile and work. So you can see everything working. Perfect. So we have a couple of warnings here. So this is unused variable. That is fine. Uh, should a variable snake case. Okay, Jesus Christ. It's very, very important. Sure. Uh, okay, and another one here is going to be... Uh, info log. Another one. Um, mm -hmm. mm, a boom. Okay, so now we have only one warning. So I really want to be able to quit the whole application by pressing Q. Uh, it is very, very natural for me. And I think I was thinking about it, I was talking about it, but I didn't implement it. Right. So let's actually try to handle keys uh, in JLFW. JLFW, uh, JLFW set key callback, right? Where is the key callback? Yeah, I, I remember we were talking about it. Uh, there we go. So that's what we need in here. Uh, so let's introduce this type function. So this is going to be that. It does not return anything. So this is literally just extern, extern fn. 
it will accept the mutable pointer to the window and all of these things are going to be basically C ints. Uh, and I would like to maybe uh, give them some sort of names, right? And the names are window. Uh, so this one is a window. I wonder if we can just do that. Window, uh, key, scan code, scan code. The other one is action and mop. Action is coming. Mop, mop. Okay, so we have that. Um, so let's go back to this thing, set key uh, callback, and uh, let's put this thing in here. So it is going to return uh, this entire thing, right? So this is going to be like that, and this is going to be mutable, and this is going to be like that. There we go. So we have glfw set key callback. Uh, and what we're going to have in the key callback, let's do ha uh, have something like uh, glfw keyboard callback. And uh, in here, we might take this thing, uh -huh, put it in here, and let's do it like this, print ln mm -mm -mm -mm. key, and we're going to just have it like this. So we're not using any of these things except the key, so I'm going to mark them as unused, super quick. Uh, boom. So what does it say? And everything seems to be okay. Uh, so type alias is never used. Okay, so this is because we never actually call this function anywhere. So jail set key callback, uh, right? So let's call it after we created the window, right? JLW create window, right? We created the window. Then we're gonna set the key callback, mm, key uh, JLW keyboard callback, and there we go. So now. Uh, if I do something like this, as you can see, we are handling this internship. So I want to press Q. Q is 81. Is 81 basically the ASCII code of this thing? Uh, ASCII, uh, ASCII, ASCII. So 81. Yeah, it is ASCII code of like Q, but it's a capital Q. But suppose it's just the name of the key then. Uh, okay, so that means in here, if uh, key is uh, Q. Well, it's an integer, right? So um, it's better to do it like this, I suppose. We need to actually say that we want to quit the application. Uh, so, oh, back seizures, holy shit. Okay, so, uh, yeah, what I was thinking about. Yeah, so how can I say that? Uh, how can I say that? Uh, I think it's kind of like set should close. Yeah, I, I don't remember how exactly it's worded. Should close. Yeah, set window should close. Yeah, you can basically mark a window as uh, should close, right? And we do have a window in here, which is pretty handy. Uh, so, but we'll have to put this function in here first. Right, so this is going to be the window, uh, mutable c int, right, mutable c int, uh, two, 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 two. so this is the window, and I suppose the value is going to be just one. Yeah, there we go, if you press Q, we're going to mark the window as should close, and that should probably work. Call to unsafe function, okay, that's fine, it's totally fine, we're not afraid of unsafe function. It works. So now I can start this thing and then instant with, with Q. That's pretty useful. Nice to nice you, nice you, nice you. So we can handle the keyboard and shit. Okay. So we have a program. Before you can use that program, you have to use it. <laughs> so uh, there is a function literally called jail use program. <laughs> That's what you have to use. <laughs> uh, okay. So extern, uh, the other thing. Uh, and uh, let's see, mm, fn uh, program, and there we go. So uh, let's go ahead and use that. Gel uh, use program program. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that that will obviously work. So there's nothing much to test in here, right? There's nothing much to test. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna set the background of the application to black, right? Because it, it's too bright, right? So, and now let's actually try to draw, um, you know, just a square, right? Just a simple square. So square, can uh, we're gonna draw it with the GL uh, triangle strip mode, right? So let's actually uh, go to my paint and I'm gonna show you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now, let me see. Uh, so, gel triangle strip, right? So, we have a gel triangle strip. Uh, that means that you only have to draw four points, right? You only draw four points, and the OpenGL will be able to derive. Okay, so the first triangle is going to be like this, right? So this is going to be the first triangle, and it's going to draw it like this. And the second triangle is going to be like this, right? So that's why to draw two triangles, you only need four points if you're using GL uh, triangle strip mode, right? So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Let's draw four points. Gel draw array. Uh, as far as I know, oh yeah, it's actually not an extension. Gel draw array is not an extension. Gel draw arrays. So that's the thing we need to have in here. Uh, yep, yep, yep. And uh, let's put this thing in here. Right. So it's gonna be something like that. Uh, Fn. Uh, we're gonna provide the mode, and mode is basically tells us uh, what mode we want to draw it in. Gel triangle, gel triangle strip, gel quad. Uh, people quite. Uh, I think these days majority of the modes are deprecated except gel triangle and gel triangle strip, right? So quads are definitely deprecated. I think. I'm not being 100 sure. But yeah. So uh, this is a, basically the index at which we start, and this is how many of them we want to draw. All right, so that's basically the function. And let's just go ahead and draw the arrays in here. So here we're going to have GL triangle uh, strip. So we're going to start with the vertex zero and we want to draw exactly four of them for the reasons I explained before. We want to have four of them. Okay, so we probably don't have this constant yet. So we'll have to copy paste it from here. So here are all the modes, right? You can draw points, lines, line loops, line strips, triangle strips, triangle fans. Yeah, triangle fan, I think, it is basically, uh, you define several points like this, right? And it automatically just fills it up like that. So here's the first triangle of the fan, here's the second one. So basically they uh, sort of like um, drawn around like a, a single you know, central point or something. I think that's what fan means, but don't quote me on that. Uh, so we're gonna be using GL triangle strip. Um, so where are all of the constants? So here is the constants. So this is going to be that uh, GL enumeration of our nation. Uh, and there we go. So GL triangle strip. So um, cool. And why is it blue? I'm not quite sure because I set it out. I still left the blue in here. OK, so there we go. We have a black screen, but there is nothing on the screen. We said we want to draw four points, um, but nothing is there because we never define those points, right? And where the points are defined? The points are defined within the shaders. So basically, uh, when you start drawing like uh, points through the array in here, uh, the vertex shader comes in and you would, be able, uh, you, would be plus, you would be able to access the number of the vertex via the variable gl vertex id, right? So that's the variable that basically holds the index of the vertex you're currently drawing. Uh, so usually people draw the, uh, the quad or the triangle by uh, putting the vertices into the something called vertex buffer. And the vertex buffer is something that you can send to GPU, right? So basically people, how people usually draw, they put everything into the buffer, send it to the GPU and they tell the shader to just extract the vertices from the GPU, right? And just draw these vertices. So the people usually do extra work of, uh, you know, packing everything and sending and then unpacking in, on the shader and stuff like that. Um, but we're not gonna be doing it like that. Uh, the reason why we're not doing it like that because this is just a test code and I don't wanna introduce more things that are needed to test this entire setup. 
So because of that, we're going to be generating the vertices on the shader. We're not going to be sending vertices to the GPU and then uh, on the shader, we're going to be sending them, passing them through the entire pipeline. No, we're going to be generating the vertices on the GPU directly. And luckily, it is actually relatively easy, right? So essentially, uh, you have these vertices, right? And uh, you know their indices. You know the indices of the vertices. So uh, this vertex is going to be indexed as 0, this one is going to be 1, this is going to be 2, this is going to be 3. So if you take a look at the indices of the vertices, 1, 2, uh, 3, and you convert them to binary, right, to binary, this is going to be 0, 0, uh, this is going to be 0, 1, uh, this is going to be 1, 0, and this is going to be 1, 1. Okay, so if you take these bits in binary representation of the indices of the vertices and just draw them on the coordinate system, right? 0, 0 is basically this one, 0, 1 is this one, 1, 0 is this one, 1, 1 is this one. So basically, if you take the index of the vertex and take its bits, it bits automatically generate you, um, generate you a quad in a stripped triangle mode, automatically. You don't have to do anything. Basically, what you have to do, uh, you have to take the bits of the vertex index and pass them as the coordinates. You, you need to convert them to the coordinates of the vertices. So this is how we're going to be generating the vertices for our quad. So that approach actually enables us not to um, create any buffers and filling them up with vertices and sending them to the GPU and stuff like that. Not saying that it's bad to do that, I'm just saying that for a simple testing code, it's kind of an overkill. It is easier to just generate such a simple primitive on the GPU itself, knowing the index of the vertex. Right, makes sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, so... Uh, two, 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 two. All right. So NGL vertex ID is that specifically index, right? So uh, let's say that X is going to be, to, to access the first bit, uh, we're going to be doing like uh, this. So this is basically the X of the vertex. And the Y of the vertex is essentially going to be shift to one, right? And that essentially gives us UV coordinates, which we can save into the vec vector, right? So this is going to be UV vec two, uh, there we go. So that's the uh, that's basically the UV coordinates, and then uh, we have to save those UV coordinates to the special variable called GL position, and this is the output of the vertex shader, right? So uh, whatever you put into this variable is going to be outputted then next to the fragment shader, right? So and it's a four-dimensional one, uh, right? So you have to provide it like this, like this, and it's four-dimensional one for the 3D reasons. So uh, it is needed like that, so we can do, um, you know, very useful 3D transformations that we're not going to go into today, but maybe one day we'll go into that. Anyway, so we generated the vertices in here. Everything's fine. So the vertices are going to be from zero to one, and everything is okay. So on the fragment shader, especially in the version 3.3, .3, I think you have to define the output like this. You have to say that you're going to output a color uh, like so. And then in the main, I'll have to set the color of the thing that I want to output. One, two, three, four. So, and let's say that the color is going to be, um, I don't know, red. Let's put red in here. Right. So essentially, the vert vertex shader is going to generate the vertices. And then the fragment shader is going to color all of the, uh, you know, triangles with the red color. There we go. So let's see if it's going to work. Uh, and it didn't, and I think I know why. I just remembered. I think I know why. Because OpenGL3 is stupid. <laughs> it makes it mandatory to create vertex array object, whatever is that supposed to mean. So essentially, there is an extra magical step that you have to do before being able to even output anything on the screen. And that's because uh, OpenGL standardization committee or whatever the hell behind OpenGL hate you personally. So yeah, anyway, uh, so let's quickly do that. First, before we can do anything, we need to generate uh, vertex arrays. 
whatever is that supposed to mean? Well, I do know what it is, but I believe that it's not necessary if you want to do something simple. It's just like whatever was in OpenGL 2.0, where uh, the vertex array object was like implicit. You, you always had an implicit vertex array object, but then they got rid of it in OpenGL 3, I think. I think this is kind of strange, in my opinion, like, and it also breaks everything. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. GL gen uh, vertex array. So we need this function, right? Okay. So extern, um, another extern. Uh, there we go. Uh, this one is going to be fn, I suppose. And we just need to provide these kind of things. Uh, there we go. So this is one function. We'll have to generate vertex array. And after we generated them, we'll have to bind them, right? Uh, there we go. And this is going to be the array. So we'll, we just need these two functions, right? And we need to call these functions before. Uh, I think it doesn't matter. I think we'll have to. Yeah, we can put them in here. Like uh, right after we initialize the context, we can put everything in here. So this is going to be mutable VAO uh, and it's going to be initially zero. So we're going to say that we're generating one VAO. Please give, give us one VAO and we are returning it uh, like this. And then we are instantly binding it. Uh, and that's it. That, that's literally everything that you have to do in here to make it work, I think. And uh, it's working. Welcome to OpenGL, by the way. Uh, welcome to OpenGL, where you're basically supposed to know this kind of shit. Yeah, you just you just have to know that. Well, almost. I mean, if we set up the debug logging, right? So there's also a way to just set up debug logging for OpenGL. Any kind of these sort of errors uh, would be reflected in a in a log. I think OpenGL would tell you that you didn't create a vertex array object, but then even if it tell you, you still need to know what is a vertex array object. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, so the vertices that we generated actually are in the right upper quadrant, which is kind of sus, don't you think? Which is kind of sus. And this is because this kind of approach generates you um, the vertices from zero to one, but the coordinates of the OpenGL, so-called normalized device coordinates, are from minus one, minus one. Not from zero, one, zero, one. They're from minus one, minus one. And that's why this particular, uh, you know, quad is offset. So we can try to fix that in a shader, right? Let's actually go ahead and fix that in a shader. Uh, so essentially, we know this thing is from zero, one uh, to zero, one. Zero, one, zero, one. What we can do, we can multiply this entire thing by two. There we go. So now these coordinates are from 0 to from 0 to 2. And now we can try to offset that by 1. There we go. So we extending it twice and we shifting it so uh, it's become it fills up the whole area, so to speak. So and now if I recompile this entire thing, uh, it fills the whole thing again. So we have a red square yet again, but now this red square is generated on um, on the GPU. Right. So you may say, like, we didn't introduce any new interesting features. It's the same boring shit that we had at the beginning, right? But since we're actually having an access to each individual pixel on that quad, we can do some cool shit. For instance, here's UV coordinates. We can pass those coordinates to the vertex shaders. So we can do something like out uh, uh, vec2 uh, UV. Right, and essentially now we have UV coordinates on the fragment shader. And on the fragment shader, we can use this UV coordinates uh, as the basis for the color. So basically, we can have different colors depending on the pixel itself, and thus create pretty cool uh, gradients. Uh, and that didn't work because we also have to say that it's going to be input. Right, so it's going to be a vector 2, UV, I think. Uh -huh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So now you can do shit like this, right? So uh, with the fragment shader, right, uh, as I already said, you now have access to each individual uh, pixel, each individual fragment, and you know its coordinates, so you can actually uh, color it differently depending on its position. So this is a classical UV pattern that you can have in here. So, <clears throat> does it make sense? Well, yeah, technically not UV, you're right. 
so yeah we can actually maybe fix that maybe we can say that this is gonna be uv right uh right and in here we're gonna actually put it like this right yeah that's it that's a bit better yeah thank you so it's a little bit more smooth now yeah. <clears throat> so uh cool you can do the same shit on the gpu right you can do the same shit on the gpu um i mean on the cpu uh but if we give more information to the shader for instance the current time we could try to animate this pattern based on the time right so how can we give information about the current time to the shader how can we set it well there is a thing called uniform right so uniform is an ability to basically send some value some integer or some float to the shaders and uh, then all of the pixels are going to be called according to that uh, global value right and that global value could be time so to be able to get the time uh, we probably need to have another binding in jlw uh so jlw get current time is there something related to time um lifetime lifetime uh, remember i think uh -huh. maybe it's called the ticks uh -huh. okay uh jlw current time i think there was a time input okay uh get time it's literally called get time okay <laughs> get time oh here it is so and it returns you uh, time in double okay uh that is fine uh i can probably work with that so it gives you time in very big resolution which is nice uh so i suppose i can simply say that it returns c double right c double mm -hmm. so it's going to come out cool all right, so um, now we need to somehow give an access to that time to the fragment shader. To give it an access, we have to define a uniform, a uh, uniform variable. Uniform, uh, I think it has to be float time. There we go. So to set that variable from the CPU, we need to know its location within the program, right? So there's a special function called gl uh, get uniform location, right? So it accepts the ID of the program and the uh, the name of the uniform, right? So it also returns gl int for some reason. I don't really know why, uh, but that's totally fine. So here is the program, and here. Um, this is go away freaking this uh two 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 so it's gonna be name and this is gonna be a character so it's gonna be const get uniform location oh yeah gl int is the location of this thing so and then with a function like gl uniform to f actually we need a one f we'll be able to set the value of that variable okay so it's gonna be like that so here is the location as you can see so this function returns you the location and then you can can set the value based on that location uh right jail float do we have a jail float we don't even have a jail float okay so uh let's quickly set it i suppose uh oh i i, I think i'm at the beggar i've been putting the open jail bindings into jail of w so as you can see i'm already tired <laughs> uh okay so this one is, has to be c float i suppose there we go it has to be c float uh yes 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 why freaking this one all right so uh let's use both of these functions mm -hmm. after we create the program right after we created the program uh we have to get its location uh, the location of the uniform so here's the program and uh, here we're gonna have time uniform name because then we'll have to create a C string. Uh, maybe not. Maybe we can like have a temp temporal thing in here, but it would be better to just give it like the time, the lifetime of the whole application, just in case. C string uh, new uh, and it's called time. And we're gonna unwrap this entire thing, and then we're gonna say as PTR. There we go so that will give us time uniform location right 
assign uniform location. And then uh, we're going to do that on each individual frame, by the way, on each individual frame. Uh, we're going to set time uniform location uh, location to glfw get time. There we go. Each frame we get the current time and we set that global uniform to that time. Let's try to compile this entire thing and see if it does not fail. Okay, so here's the thing. The time isn't uh, double, but this thing accepts uh, float. So we can actually truncate it a little bit. I don't think it matters. We don't really need the time in a very big resolution anyway. Okay, so everything's working, right? Everything's compiling and it doesn't really crash or anything, uh, but we don't use the time at all. So one thing we wanna do in here is essentially maybe take x and y of the uv coordinates and just do sign on them right do sign on them but the problem with sign is that it goes from minus one to one but for uv we need to have it from zero to one so uh let's actually write a simple wrapper right simple wrapper sign zero one uh so this is going to be an angle uh right uh and yeah it's going to be like this sine a minus one one if i add one it's going to be from zero to two and then i can divide this entire thing by two and it will be from zero to one so here i can simply do something like sine uh zero one perfect so uh and let's see how it's gonna go so it's not gonna do anything special but yeah this is how it looks like so now uh if i add time to this entire thing it should start animating uh, and it is kind of animating there we go so it's kind of strange that it goes to white completely uh, so we can try to put it like this so is that a correct thing to do at all maybe maybe we can also have a cosine but yeah that's that's fine so it just creates this kind of thing so i think i want to also like have a cosine for this entire thing all right so let's create a cosine uh sine cosine there we go and it's going to be sine uh cosine so it's going to be like a little bit of an offset between those things uh all right so and then um let's actually put it like that uh so i'm just doing like a hello world of OpenGL. nothing particularly special so just testing how all these things works uh, together. C01, and here we can do uv x plus uv y plus time, and uh, maybe that will create a more interesting part now. So yeah, this is something that is really hard to achieve on GPU, or on CPU, because of the frame rate. You can you cannot really maintain such a picture with such a frame rate on CPU right so and that's kind of cool isn't it so you can actually do that on a bigger resolution uh so with you can set like uh, something like this uh -huh. and it will maintain that for like a good frame rate uh on this kind of resolution so uh yeah and all of that is done without using cargo without using any frameworks or anything like that we were just using two libraries glfw and opengl and this is a single file uh look how hard it is to write this kind of opengl application opengl application in rust without cargo and without like any like special wrappers or dependencies 210 lines of code. Is that too much code? Is that a lot of code? To be fair, for me, 1,000 lines is small. I would even say 3,000 lines is small. Even five. 5,000 lines is like nothing. 200 lines. So it's just for people who will say that it's going to be difficult to maintain 200 lines of code. 200 lines of code. Is it difficult to maintain? Is it really difficult to maintain? It's unsafe, yes, but this is because I didn't put any effort into making it more safe. Uh, is it going to blow up significantly if, you, if I start adding uh, safe features? Maybe, maybe not. But have you tried to do that? Have you actually measured how much it's going to blow up? 
Um, so, yeah. Everything is super reasonable for me, I don't know. It's just like it's not that much code and it's not that hard. If you know how to use these C libraries, you can use them in Rust. So, and this is something I think a Rust community should uh, advertise more, right? To bring more people into Rust if you really want Rust to be like to win and stuff like that. You need to demonstrate. Look, C developers, you have your favorite libraries. You can just use them without any bullshit that you hate. Because C developers, like hardcore C developers, they absolutely hate all this tooling, all of this crap and stuff like that. And they look at Rust and they're like, yikes, yikes. You can show them, here's here is the stuff, here's your library. You just use it in Rust without any stupid annoying tooling and it just works. Your favorite library. They like that. So, I don't know. I'm just saying. Um, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, I don't really care if Rust is going to win or not. I don't care about languages. I look at programming like beyond programming languages. Like programming language for me is just like a like a facade. Uh, so I'm not really interested in them. Uh, so um, we have that. I wanted to do another thing, I suppose. Um, Oh yeah, I wanted to actually download render doc, render doc. Yeah, yeah. Um, two, two, two. Is Rust beginner friendly? Yeah. Depends on the definition. Beginner in what? In programming? If you only start in programming, like I didn't think that there are beginner friendly languages. Maybe Python is a beginner friendly. Uh, Okay, so we have a render doc. I wanted to just show you something. Um, two, 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 two. So I'm gonna actually just unpack this entire thing. So uh, render doc is quite convenient because it can show you FPS. Um, I hate the keyword let in languages. I personally don't care because I think it's like not important syntactical thing that you can get used to. So I'm not really interested in syntactical things of in like of languages, even though sometimes um, it is important, right? So for instance, uh, there is a classical problem of uh, syntactical transitioning from if statement to switch statement that I've never seen any language try to solve except maybe Jai. Uh, but it's not that important anyway at the end of the day. I think what's important more is the semantic of the language. So all of that let, var, it doesn't fucking matter. Uh, okay. Mm. But syntactical transition from if to switch is actually a problem that nobody recognizes and nobody even ever tried to solve, except Jai, by the way. I was actually extremely surprised that Jai tried to address that syntactical problem because I thought I'm the only one who cared about it. Um, so yeah, well, where is 2fpec for you? Uh, two, two. So the, the gist of the problem, I can spend whole day talking about it, but the gist of this problem is that um, it is very syntactically difficult and a lot of friction if you have an if statement that checks one condition to transition it into switch statement that checks several of them because you can you have to complete uh, completely switch up the whole construction right so and um yeah so that's the point but it doesn't matter okay so let's actually try to launch this application and uh what do we have in here you would see that this application runs at 60 fps right so it runs at 60 fps and this is because it is v-sync so it locked at 60 fps by the um by the jlw as far as i know it just set the swap interval like this so here's the thing that you can do you can actually turn off vsync so i suppose you do it like this jlw uh you know, swap interval i think that's what you're doing here yeah there we go so and to turn it off you have to set it to zero i think right so and it's gonna be something like this uh, it's gonna be interval c int and I'm gonna call this entire thing maybe after I made the context, maybe before uh, uh, swap interval and it's gonna be zero. So let's actually try to 
uh, recompile the entire thing. Uh, okay, so speaking of, you know, what your GPU can do. Uh -huh. But I'm also streaming, so... Two hundred and seventy-eight FPS. Huh. Mm. Expected actually more. I wonder why is it so low. Only two hundred and sixty-five FPS. Mm. If I reduce the resolution, it could be because of the OBS actually. Yeah, it could be because of the OBS. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So if it's going to be uh, like around 8600, right? Uh, and let's just run the render dock. Uh, all right. Well, we, with the lower resolution, we have 600 FPS. Uh, okay. So, but maybe with, without OBS, it would be even higher. Who knows? Because I definitely had higher when I was not streaming. So when I'm not streaming on my machine, this kind of pattern, I think it can run at 2000 FPS. Um, is it using integrated GPU? It's using the Intel one. Mm, it's using the Intel one. So in the, on the Intel one, when I'm not streaming, uh, it this kind of thing, I tested it runs on 2000 FPS. So I think it's streaming that actually kind of like slows it down a little bit. Um, it kind of slows it down a little bit. Uh, so, all right. So we managed to set up uh, a simple OpenGL application in Rust. And uh, we can try to use this application to actually render the 2MPEG for you video uh in real time so the, the whole thing that i did today was to actually make it possible to um, run the following to generate the following video in real time or at least the preview so it's actually regenerated again i think it got deleted yeah i think it got deleted straight up uh so let's regenerate the video mm -mm. Let's combine with the change anything we may see but uh our application is not doing any sophisticated algorithms unless rust generates some crap that slows everything down maybe maybe it's for yeah rust might generate some boundary checks that may slow down the execution we may try to actually compile with o3 yeah that's a good point so but i'm going to show what i want to generate in real time with OpenGL. so just a just a quick note and then we can try with o3 uh so let's go so it needs to also convert this entire thing Mm. How can you manually choose the other GPU with code? I have no idea. Um, I have no idea how to make my other GPU work on this laptop. I've been using the Intel GPU on it uh, since day one. <laughs> because I know nothing about computers, I'm sorry. Uh, to be fair, the reason is just I'm too lazy, I don't give a shit. Um, so here's the thing that we're generating offline. This entire thing is generated offline, frame by frame, pixel by pixel, uh, sound sample by sound sample, dumped into raw files, and then merged together with FFmpeg. So this is the thing that we generated. Oh, that is very interesting. I run it on a wrong machine, first of all. Yeah, I run it on the wrong machine and I didn't know VLC is capable of actually playing shit in ASCII. Okay, that is cool. But that's not what I wanted to show. Well, like it's it nice to know that it can do this kind of shit, but that's not what I wanted to show. <laughs> what I wanted to show is uh, this thing. So it was generated on CPU in offline mode, right? Uh, and also including the sounds, right? The sounds were generated every time the rectangle, uh, you know, bounces over the, um, 
of the sides and we generated it on the level of sound waves right we generated the samples and shit like that what i'm trying to do is to actually do the same thing but in real time so for the graphics we already set up opengl uh, at some point uh, we're also going to have bindings for alsa so we could also uh, generate these sound waves directly we're going to do that in a similar way as we do with opengl and at some point we'll be able to do this kind of thing in real time right i want to do this kind of stuff in real time so uh, all of that work was just basically preparation of doing this thing in real time with OpenGL and ALSA and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I think we need to do a committee committee. Uh, super quick. So we have a main... Uh, Roman Codes subscribed with Twitch Prime. Thank you, thank you so much for the subscription. Really appreciate it. Uh, so we renamed main to main video and I suppose because of that uh, we'll have to say main video uh, main video and there we go uh, all right so here what we did uh, rename main to main video uh, and then we introduced uh, introduce uh, main open gel there we go and we're gonna push that right into the repo. You can find the source code of this entire thing. Uh, right, you can find this entire thing in here, right? So if you go to the source code here, uh, drop your files. I don't wanna drop any files, thank you so much. So yeah, here's the source code and you can find the, you know, the, everything that we did today in here. So it includes all of the necessary OpenGL bindings, all the necessary JLFW bindings, and uh, the code that just generates that pattern. So, and you can, I suppose, just compile main OpenGL and just run it. And if you have JLFW and OpenGL, it should work, right? It has to be installed on your system. Uh, so, yep, that's, I guess, it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching me right now. I really appreciate it. I have a good one and I see you next time. Next time, maybe we're gonna actually port the renderer to OpenGL, right? And maybe the next step is gonna be actually porting the sound generation into ALSA. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, if you're watching this shit on, on YouTube, check out the description. I put everything into the description. Uh, if you, um, you know, want to watch the entirety on YouTube, here is the YouTube channel I'm talking about. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Love you. Mm -hmm.